Episode 1 Too Young to Die I don't really care for this restaurant, do you see? No, I much prefer that little place we usually go to. You know, you're drinking far too much coffee, Paul. Mm, it's a sign I've been working hard. Have you really finished the novel? Mm-hmm. Finished it last night. Well, are you pleased with it? Am I ever really pleased with anything I write? Steve, how would you like a holiday? Switzerland? Wherever you like. I think about it. Yes. <laughs> I know the next line. If we go to Switzerland, I'll need an awful lot of new clothes, well, darling. It's true, I shall. <laughs> Paul, mm? that man over there, near the service table, he keeps staring at us. Yes, I saw him. His name's Morris Lonsdale. He's a financier. Owns a great deal of property in the West End. As a matter of fact, I think he owns this place. Do you know him? Only by sight. Morris Lonsdale. I've seen his name in the gossip column. Mm, you probably have. I say, looks like a financier. Even to the carnation in his buttonhole. <laughs> oh, he's leaving. Yeah, he probably heard you saying rude things about him. But he can't possibly no, have heard. No, of course he couldn't. To get back to Switzerland, when would you want to go? Oh, whenever you feel like it. We could leave on Friday. Oh, that's pretty short notice. I mean, you've got to book the hotel, and I, I have to arrange for Charlie to do... Excuse me, sir. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Lonsdale asked me to give you this note. Oh, thank you. Oh, and you might get my bill, waiter. Yes, sir. What is it, Paul? He says he'd like to see me in his office. What about, I wonder? <laughs> We'd better go and find out, darling. Do sit down. Uh, this chair's more comfortable, Mrs. Temple. Thank you. I do hope you'll forgive me for staring at you just now, but uh, it seems such a remarkable coincidence. Coincidence? Yes, I picked up the phone twice this morning with the intention of speaking to you. And then at the last moment, I changed my mind. Well, what did you want to speak to me about? It was about my sister, Margaret, Margaret Milbourne. You may remember her as Margaret Beverly, the actress. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, about six years ago, she married Carl Milbourne, the book publisher. Carl Milbourne? Yes. Wasn't he killed in a car accident about a fortnight ago? Yes. You knew Carl? Uh, I'd met him, but I didn't know him well. Where did this accident happen? In Geneva. Dreadful business. Margaret, poor darling, has been in a terrible state ever since it happened. The last two weeks have been pure hell. It must have been a dreadful shock for her. Yes. Was she with her husband when it happened? No, he was in Switzerland on business. He was knocked down crossing the road. I had to take Margaret out to Geneva to identify the body. Believe me, that was quite an ordeal. Carl was so badly smashed up, his face disfigured. Mm, it must have been an ordeal for both of you. Uh, Margaret's always been highly strung, and I'm afraid this has quite unbalanced her. That's why I was going to phone you, Temple. Uh -huh. You see... Uh, she's got this extraordinary idea that, well, that Carl isn't dead. But surely you saw the body. Yes, I'm positive it was Carl. Well, apart from anything else, I recognised the suit he was wearing. Then why should your sister think that it wasn't her husband who was killed? Well, for one thing, she consulted a medium. She asked her to get in touch with Carl, and she failed. And Margaret seems to think that this proves that Carl is still alive. But sure, oh, it's ridiculous, but you know what women are when they get ideas into their heads. Also, Margaret's very depressed because they had a quarrel of some kind just before he left for Geneva. But can't her doctor help her? He prescribes sedatives, Mrs. Temple, but she refuses to take them. I'm afraid my sister's completely dominated by this obsession of hers... So much so that she's made up her mind to consult you, Mr. Temple. But why should she consult me? Can't you guess why? She wants you to find her husband for her. How much further have we got to go? I thought you parked the car just round the corner. I did. I left it in front of this letterbox. Well, it isn't here. Well, it is very odd. It's very annoying. I'm getting terribly wet. I don't understand this. I swear I left it here. Did you lock it? Yes, of course I did. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't just stand here. No, I suppose. I suppose I'd better ring the police. We'll go back to the restaurant. I can phone from there and we can pick up a cab. All right. Oh, gosh, it's absolutely pouring down now. Wait till you see the papers tomorrow morning, won't I? Just look a fool. Paul Temple's car stolen. Private eye <laughs> sends for Scotland Yard. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, you picked a very nice job, Den. I'll say that. Yeah. She goes like a bird. And did you find any papers? No, I went through the pockets and the dash. No idea who it belongs to, then? No. I picked her up in one of those squares off Knightsbridge. Oh, when she's had one of Bert's repaints, no one will recognise her. That. And only 5,000 on the clock. Yeah. Good as new. <laughs> Better in some ways. Ah, yes, a hell of a night. Shouldn't think the cops will be hanging around on a night like this. Hey, how long will it take us to get to Bert's place? Oh, about 40 minutes. We don't want to go too fast. No. Don't take any chances. Hey, does that car want to pass us? It's been on our tail for the last couple of miles. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching him in the mirror. It couldn't be a police car. <laughs> you tell me. I'll slow up a bit. If they're slowing up as well. I can't see for the headlights. I don't think it's the cops, then. Oh, well, we're coming to the double carriageway. I'll wave them on. Oh, I wish we'd change those damn plates. Hey, they're coming up, then. Yeah, what the hell's he playing at? Ah, oh, it's all right. It isn't the cops. Pull over a bit. Uh, are they still coming? They've, they've opened the side window. What the devil are they? Look out, Denny's got a gun. What are you talking about? Den, pull up. We're going for the ditch. Steve. Yes, darling? Do you think you could tear yourself away from that paper for a minute and pour me some coffee? Hmm? Oh, sorry, dear. Uh, we're out of coffee, so I asked Charlie to make tea. All right, then, tea. And maybe a little sympathy. Sympathy? Well, the car was stolen last night, remember? <laughs> I've been reading about it in the paper. Mr Temple, usually so self-possessed, was irritated when our reporter asked about the stolen car. Hmm. Don't ask me what happened, snapped Britain's number one private eye. I haven't a clue. I never said a word about not having a clue. Yes, what is it, Charlie? Uh, there's a police inspector in the hall, Inspector Lloyd, I think he said. Oh, that'll be about the car. Ask him to come in here. Yes, sir. In here, please, sir. No, thank you. Good morning, Mr Temple. Oh, good morning, Inspector. I don't think you've met my wife. No. Steve, I... this is Inspector Lloyd. Good morning, Mrs. Good Temple. Good morning, Inspector. I just looked in to let you know we found the car. Have you by Timothy? That's quick work. Yes, but I'm afraid it's in pretty bad shape. There was a serious accident. Oh. Where did you find it, Inspector? Uh, we found it in the ditch just outside St. Albans. It's very nearly a write-off, I should say. Oh, oh no. Lord. Any trace of the driver? I'm afraid so. He was still at the wheel with two bullets through his head. Oh, what? no. Well, who was the man, do you know? Yes, he was a well-known car thief named Den Roberts. We found some fake number plates in the back of the car. I dare say he planned to swap them as soon as he got to St Albans. You've no idea who shot him, I suppose? No, we haven't. We think there was another person in the car, but he or she got clean away. Mm. It's a bit of a problem, but Sir Graham said to let you know we're working on it. Mm, thank you. What's happened to the car, by the way? It's in the Pentagon garage in Cumberland Street. They're going to give you a ring. Oh, good. Well, if there's nothing else, Mr Temple, I have a busy morning. Yes, yes, of course. I'll see you out. No, no, no. I'll see myself out. Good morning, Mr Temple. Good morning, Inspector. Good morning. I suppose it didn't occur to Inspector Lloyd that whoever shot the thief might have thought that they were shooting you. What? Huh? Oh, good Lord, Steve. Whatever gave you that idea? Ah, you know. You'd thought of that yourself. You must have done it. It never entered my head. Paul, it was your car. It was a very dark night. The number plates hadn't been changed, so anyone following the car must have thought it was you who was driving it. Not necessarily. Besides, how do you know the shots came from another car? Yes, Charlie, what is it now? Uh, it's uh, Mrs Milburn, sir. The lady seemed a bit upset, so I'll put her in the study. Oh, all right. Tell her we'll be with her in a minute. No use, Mr. Temple. The more I think about it, the more certain I am that the dead man we saw that morning wasn't Carl. Then why didn't you say so at the time, Mrs. Murphy? I was so upset, so confused. Mm. But your brother identified the body. Yes, I know, but he was upset too, and... You've seen Morris, then? Yes. My wife and I had dinner last night at the Lesco restaurant. Your brother invited us into his office for a drink. Oh. Tell me... What was your husband doing in Geneva? He went out there on business to see Julia Carrington. The Hollywood film star? Yes. She retired to Switzerland four years ago and Carl had heard a rumour that she was writing her memoirs. He was very anxious to find out if it was true. Yes, the autobiography of Julia Carrington would certainly be a scoop for any publisher. Yes, that's what Carl said. He had a very good agent in Switzerland, but he insisted on seeing this woman himself. 
Mrs. Milbourne, I don't doubt that you really believe that your husband isn't dead, but is this feeling just a hunch? No, it's not just a hunch, Mrs. Temple. It's more than that. A very great deal more. Do you mean you have proof that he's alive? Yes, I have proof, and that's why I came to see you. Then tell me about it, Mrs. Milbourne. When I came back from Switzerland after the accident, there was a parcel waiting at home addressed to Carl from a shop in St. Moritz. It contained a hat, Carl's hat, the one he wore when he went to Geneva. He had a weakness for buying hats. I knew immediately what had happened. He had apparently visited St. Moritz, bought a new hat, and had told them to post his old one home. Yes, but this must have happened before the accident. I'm coming to that, Mr. Temple. The hat was no use to me, of course, so I gave it to the gardener. The day before yesterday, he asked to see me. He said he'd found a piece of paper in the brim of the hat. Here it is. Oh, go on, Mrs. Milburn. Will you see the handwriting and the date on that piece of paper? Yes, I see the date. January the 6th. That note was written two days after the accident. Yet it was written by my husband. Are you sure it's your husband's handwriting? Yes, I'm positive. What's in the note, Paul? Please don't worry. Have seen Randolph and everything will be all right. We'll get in touch later. But your husband couldn't have written that note after the accident, Mrs. Milbourne? Yes, if you believe it was my husband that was involved in the accident. But I've already told you I don't think it was Carl who was killed. Then who was it? I don't know. Mrs. Milbourne... Assuming your husband did write this, does it make any sense to you? Have you heard of anyone called Randolph? No, I haven't. I can't imagine what he means. Well, now, what would you like me to do? I'd like you and Mrs. Temple to come out to Switzerland with me. With you? I want you to make absolutely sure that it was my husband who arranged for the hat to be sent back to London. Also, I'd like to know what Carl was doing in St. Moritz. He never told me he was going there. But well, perhaps he went to see Julia Carrington. I believe she has a house in St. Moritz, uh, as well as Geneva. Well, my brother spoke to Miss Carrington when we were in Geneva. She said she'd never seen Carl. Apparently her secretary had had a brief chat with him, and that was all. I see. Mrs. Milbourne, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Please, ask me anything you like. Did you and your husband have a quarrel before he left for Geneva? How did you know? Did Morris tell you? He vaguely mentioned it. Well, uh, well, please don't get the wrong impression. Carl and I very rarely quarrelled. In fact, there was only one thing we ever really disagreed about. Mm -hmm. Carl was anxious to avoid death duties. He always took it for granted he'd go first and... Well, he just would talk about it. I hated the subject. I, I used to keep telling him, you're too young to die, Carl. And he talked about death duties the night before he left for Geneva? Yes, he did. But we were quite friendly again the next morning, and I saw him off at the airport. I see. Well, I'd like to think about what you've told me, Mrs. Milbourne. Where can I get in touch with you? Oh, here's my card. You can ring me at that number any time. Ah, thank you. I'm very grateful to you for listening to me. It's very kind of you both. I, I hope you'll be able to help me, Mr. Temple. Well, we'll see. I'll see you out, Mrs. Milbourne. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Temple. Goodbye, Mrs. Milbourne. Paul Temple speaking. Good morning, Mr. Temple. This is the Pentagon Garage, Cumberland Street. Oh, good morning. We've got your car here, Mr. Temple. Oh, yes. What's it like? <laughs> Um, well, this morning sometime, probably about uh, half past eleven. That's fine. Ask for Mr. Watford. I'll do that. Thank you for ringing. Who was that, darling? It was the garage about the car. Did you see Mrs. Milbourne off all right? Yes. Poor woman, she's had a bad time of it. Yes. Well, are we going to Switzerland? I don't know. There are one or two things which don't quite add up. Such as? Well, for one thing, if that note was written by Carl Milbourne, why on earth didn't he... It's all right, I'll take it. And hello? Is that Paul Temple? Yeah, I seem to know that voice. You should, Ducky. It's Dolly. Dolly Brazer. Good Lord, Dolly, after all this time. How are things with you? To tell you the truth, Mr Temple, dear, I'm a bit worried. 
Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Dolly. Is there anything I can do? Yes, I think there is. I'd like to talk to you, Ducky, and tell you all about it. All right, Dolly. Why don't you come round here? Well, if it's all the same to you, dear, I'd sooner meet you somewhere else. In the open somewhere, the park, someplace like that. <laughs> well, what about the zoo? Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Just the place. Mm? I'll be inside the main gate in about 40 minutes. See you then, dearie. Yes. All right, Dolly. Well, you're certainly having a busy morning, Mr. Temple. Who is this Dolly? Take your mind back seven years, Steve, to the all-time flop of the season over my dead Ooh. body by Paul Temple. Yes. Dolly Brazer played the maid. I remember her now. A pert little redhead. Hmm. Wasn't she involved in some, uh, oh, yes, yeah, some drug scandal or other? Yes, I put her in touch with Arnold and he got her off with a very light sentence. She was pathetically grateful. Mm, I remember. Well, I must get a move on. Steve, let's meet for lunch. Usual place, about 1.15. Yes, that's fine. And Paul, mm -hmm. don't be too nice to Dolly Brazer. <laughs> ah, there you are, Dolly. It's nice to see you again. How are you? Oh, I'm all right, dearie. You don't look all right. You look very worried to me. Yes, well... Oh, come on, let's sit down. <clears throat> Now, what's all this about? Have you been getting into mischief again? No. No, I haven't. Well, what are you doing these days? Where are you working? Well, I've tried all sorts of things since we last met, Mr. Temple. I even did typing till I found out I couldn't spell. <laughs> you haven't answered my question, Dolly. Where are you working now? Um, I'm a nightclub hostess. Oh, where? Oh, in Soho. And you're in trouble? No, I'm just worried about you. Worried about me? Yes. I've never forgotten what you did for me. And, uh, look, Mr. Templer, I wish you wouldn't get mixed up in this Swiss affair. Swiss affair? You mean Mrs. Milbourne and... Yes. Go on, Dolly. I... I don't want to see anything happen to you, or that sweet wife of yours. Why should anything happen to us? It will, if you get involved in this Milbourne affair. Do you know Mrs. Milbourne? No, I've only heard of her, in a roundabout way. She came to see me this morning. Yes, I know. She told you her husband wasn't dead and she asked you to help her. Yes. Well, don't, Mr. Temple. Don't. It just isn't worth it. It's very nice for you to be so concerned about us, Dolly, but Steve and I have come up against a few ruthless people in our time and we're still alive to tell the tale. Then you are going to help Mrs. Milbourne. I haven't made up my mind yet. Well, I can't say I haven't warned you. I'd never have forgiven myself if I hadn't passed the word. But you haven't passed the word, Dolly. You haven't told me anything. I've told you to be careful. Dolly, is Carl Milbourne dead? Was he killed in that car accident? I don't know anything about Carl Milbourne. All I know is... Go on. A certain person doesn't want you to help Mrs Milbourne. Who is this person? I don't know. But you must know. I don't. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Why? Because I'd be taking a terrible risk and... Too young to die. Too young to die? Yes. Remember that, Mr. Temple. I'm too young to die. There's a Mr. Stone from the Pentagon Garage. He'd like to have a word with you, Mrs. Temple. Oh, devil, I'm just going out. All right, Charlie. Right. Mr. Stone. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Temple. Good morning. I'm from the Pentagon Garage in Cumberland Street. Mr. Temple's hired a car and asked me to deliver it to this address. Oh, splendid. Just in time, Mr. Stone. I was going to ring for a taxi. Oh, good. Then I'll see you downstairs, madam. The car's on the other side of the road. Thank you. I'll be down in a moment. Here's the key, Mrs. Temple. The logbook's in the cubby hole with the insurance certificate, just in case you need them. Thank you. Can I give you a lift anywhere? Very kind of you. Which way are you going? Towards Piccadilly. Oh. Oh, no, thank you, Mrs. Temple. I've got to go down to Kensington. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hello? Is Mrs. Temple there, Charlie? Oh, hello, Mr. T. No, she's just this minute driven off in a car. What car? Well, the one from the Pentagon Garage. But I'm speaking to the garage now. Who delivered the car? Uh, a Mr. Stone. He said you rented a car Charlie, and... listen. Run downstairs. Get Mrs. Temple out of that car at once. 
But she's gone, Mr. Temple. She left a couple of minutes Charlie, ago. get downstairs. Run like hell. Whatever you do, get Steve out of that car. Nice little traffic block, lady. <laughs> uh, we'll be here for hours. I stuck at these flaming lights for 20 minutes last month and by fear missed his train. Why on earth can't they do something about it? Mrs. Temple! Mrs. Temple, hold on! Charlie, whatever's the matter? Mr. Temple on the phone! But jump in, jump in, we're moving! You've got to get out the car! But I can't leave it in the middle of the road! For heaven's sake, get out! Mr. Temple sounded desperate! All right, all right. What's going on? You can't leave a car in the middle of the road like this. I'm sorry, officer, but you see... Madam, this... you're obstructing the traffic. You'll have to move that car immediately. Do you feel all right now, Steve? Yes, I feel much better. I think I'll get up, Paul, and have a cup of tea. No, no, there's no need to get up. Charlie, fetch us one. If it hadn't been for Charlie, I don't know what would have happened. I do. Oh, Paul, don't. Have you been on to the garage? Yes. Needless to say, they'd never heard of your Mr. Stone. What happened this morning? This morning? The Dolly Brazer. Oh, can't you guess? She tried to borrow some money from me, a hundred pounds. And did you lend it to no. her? And why not? Oh, I thought it might be the thin end of the wedge. You know what it is, Steve. Once you start lending people money, Paul! They... What really happened this morning? What did Dolly want to talk to you about? She gave me a warning. Not to get involved in the Milbourne affair. Ah, I see. I didn't mean to tell you about this, Steve. Not today, at any rate. I, I didn't want to upset you. Well, I'm not upset. I've got to know these things. I've got to be kept in the picture. Please, Paul. <laughs> All right, darling. Mrs Milbourne's on the phone, sir. Shall I switch it through? Uh, yes, please do, Charlie. Right. Hello? Mr. Temple, this is Margaret Milbourne. You left a message for me to phone you. Oh, yes, I wanted to ask you something. Um, are you alone? Yes. Yes, I am. Did you by any chance tell anyone that you intended to consult me? I told Morris, my brother. Yes, yes, I know. I mean anyone else. Well, thank you, Mrs. Milbourne. So sorry to have bothered you. I'll be in touch with you again later. Steve, have we got anything fixed for this evening? No, thank goodness. Why? I'm going out after dinner. I'll be about an hour. I'm going to have another talk with Maurice Lonsdale. I'm glad you saw my sister, but uh, I hope you didn't take her too seriously. I don't think we can dismiss completely everything she says, Lonsdale. No, of course not, but uh, the fact remains that I saw Carl after the accident and I identified him. However, you're a very busy man. I'm sure you had a reason for coming to see me this evening. Yes, I wanted to ask you something. Well, please go ahead. Did you tell anyone that your sister was going to consult me? I... Uh, I may have mentioned it casually to someone when we were talking about my sister. Why is it important? While my wife and I were talking to you last night, my car was stolen. Mm -hmm. The man who stole it was shot. He was mistaken for me. Good Lord. At lunchtime today, there was an attempt, a deliberate attempt, to kill my wife. And you think that both these... I think that someone is deliberately trying to stop me taking an interest in the Milbourne case. But surely no one would go to such lengths. Yes, what is it, Green? I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but there's been a phone message for Mr. Temple. Oh, yes? Uh, Inspector Lloyd telephoned, sir. He wants to see you immediately. He's at the Middlesex Hospital. Right, thank you. Will you excuse me, Lonsdale? Yes, of course. Uh, Green, tell Williams to bring the car around and run Mr. Temple to the hospital. Yes, sir. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Ah, oh, there you are, Temple. I'm glad you got my message. Inspector, what is it? What's happened? About an hour ago, one of our people found a woman called Dolly Brazer in a cul-de-sac just off Kilburn Street. She'd been beaten up very badly, I'm afraid. How badly? Well, she's pretty bad. She's only spoken twice. On both occasions, she mentioned your name. I'd like you to have a word with her, Temple, try and find out what, how it happened. Yes, all right. If you'll uh, follow me...
And this is Mr. Temple, Doctor. Ah, yes. Good evening. Good evening, Doctor. I've given her an injection, Mr. Temple, so I can't allow you more than a few minutes. No, no, of course not. All right, nurse. Dolly, this is Paul Temple. Can you hear me, Dolly? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Come a little closer, dear. All right. There. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Who was it, Dolly? Who did it? I don't know who did it. Honestly, I don't know. You've no need to worry if you talk to me. Mr. Temple, I'm going to get better, aren't I? Yes, of course you are. You sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. I'm too young to die. Remember that, Mr. Temple. Too young to die. In the first episode of Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery, Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. Production for the BBC was by Martin C. Webster. Well, let's just hope that poor old Dolly is still with us when Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery continues at the same time tomorrow. Meanwhile, a few more names to add to that list of credits. They are Charlie was played by John Badley, Inspector Lloyd by Wilfred Carter, Morris Lonsdale by Patrick Barr, Margaret Milbourne by Isabel Dean, Dolly by Isabel Rennie, with Frederick Treves, Pat Connell, Alan Haynes, Anthony Hall, James Thomason, Malcolm Terrace, Bruce Beebe and Peter Bartlett. And let's not forget the scriptwriter who was Francis Durbridge. What do you think when you look at me? A woman of faith? An expert? Or oppressed? Brainwashed? A terrorist? On BBC Radio 4 Extra, interviews with some of TED Talk's most compelling speakers. We really have the opportunity to overcome the major challenges that humanity has struggled with for millennia. Whatever that means for you, that how you're going to facilitate change, you just need to do it. The TED Interview with Chris Anderson. These ideas are for everyone, not for one group, and you're ready to fight for that. On BBC Radio 4 Extra, Monday mornings at 11 and in the evenings at 9. Now, for more than four decades, David Bowie entranced his followers. Here on Radio 4 Extra, Samira Ahmed looks at his particular appeal for British Asian women. She explores how women across the generations were inspired by the skinny South Londoner who challenged gender barriers and... Episode 2, Concerning Mrs Milbourne. Don't be silly. Of course you're going to get better. I'm, I'm too young to die. Remember that, Mr. Temple. Too young to die. Now, don't worry. You're in very good hands and you'll soon be feeling better. If there's anything you want, I'll see you get it, Dolly. Thank you. Now, tell me, were you beaten up because you warned me about the Milbourne case? Yes. Yes, I, I think so. Who did it? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But Dolly, you must have some idea who did it. Look, I told her this morning. It mustn't get mixed up in this affair. It mustn't. All right, Dolly. I'm afraid that'll have to be all this time, no. Mr. Temple. Um, nurse, the screen. Hello, Steve. How are you feeling? Oh, I feel much better. Oh, I'm so glad, darling. Are there any messages? That's the Graham phone. Oh. He wants me to go to his office tomorrow morning and look at some photographs. They're still trying to find our friend with the bomb. Uh. Oh, and um, Maurice Lonsdale rang. He wants you to call him back. Did he say what he wanted? No. He was very friendly, but I think he knows I don't like him. <laughs> he got the message. Hello? Oh, hello. I've been turning over in my mind the conversation we had earlier on, and I remember now that I did mention you and Margaret to a friend. Oh? I discussed the car accident at some length, and I'm pretty certain I told her that Margaret was going to consult you. 
I see. But there's nothing to worry about, Temple. Frida's the soul of discretion. Frida, did you say? Yes, Frida Sands. You probably met her. No, I don't think I have. Well, we must rectify that. I'm sure both you and Mrs. Temple would like her. I'll arrange a little dinner party one evening. Oh, that'll be very pleasant. Meanwhile, if any other name occurs to you in this connection, do give me a ring. Yes, of course. Goodbye, Temple. Goodbye. Steve, do you know a woman called Frida Sands? Frida Sands? Mm. Uh, hasn't she a secretarial bureau in Baker Street? Yes, that's right. I knew the name was familiar. What about her? Apparently she's a friend of Lonsdale's. He told her about the car accident and that his sister intended to consult me. Well, is, is that important? Could be. It's obvious that the attempts on our lives and the attack on Dolly Brazer are related. Someone's determined to stop me from investigating this case. And you think that someone could be Frida Sands? Uh, excuse me, sir. Mrs. Milbourne's here. She says she's got to see you. She's in a terrible tizz, I'm afraid. Ask her to come in, Charlie. Yes, right, she brings I'll see Mrs. Milbourne on her own, Steve, if you'd like to go to bed. Oh, no, I'm too curious. I want to know what she wants at this time of night. All right. Good evening. Oh, Good evening. Come in, Mrs. Milbourne. So sorry to trouble you at this time of night, but I, I just had to see you. Why, what's happened? I've got definite proof now that it wasn't my husband who was killed in that car accident. Oh. There's absolutely no doubt that Carl is still alive. I take it something's happened since we last met? Yes. About four o'clock this afternoon, I wasn't feeling at all well, and I went to bed for an hour or two. I was just dozing off when the telephone rang. Hello? Could I speak to Mrs. Margaret Milbourne, please? My name is Clayton, Danny Clayton. This is Mrs. Milbourne speaking. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Milbourne. Uh, you don't know me, but I met your husband a little while ago. Oh? If it isn't intruding on your privacy, I think it'd be a good idea if we had a little talk sometime. Where did you meet my husband? In Geneva. Oh. As a matter of fact, I've just flown in from there this afternoon to see you. Who are you exactly? What is it you want? I'm Danny Clayton. I'm 30 years old. I was born in New York. I work for Julia Carrington and... Julia Carrington, the film star? That's right. I'm her, um, a confidential secretary, amongst other things. But what is it you want to see me about? About your husband. It's very important. Oh, all right, Mr. Clayton. Where shall we meet? I'm staying at the New Wilton Hotel. I'll see you in the cocktail bar downstairs in, uh, Let's see now, it's five o'clock in exactly one hour. I'll be there. I'm sure you will, Mrs. Milborn. You know, it sure is nice of you to come at a moment's notice like this. Mr. Clayton, on the telephone you said you wanted to talk to me about my... About your husband. Yes. Sure, that's right, I do. But let me tell you a little bit about myself first. I work for Julia Carrington. I'm her confidential secretary, whipping boy and general yes-man. We've travelled all over Europe together. She's given me the sack five times. She's a bitch, but fortunately for me, a very generous one. What's all this got to do with my husband? He came to see Julia just before the um, car accident. Only he didn't see her... He saw me instead. Mr. Clayton, I wish you'd get to the point. Well, now, I hope what I'm going to tell you won't be too much of a shock. Go on. What would you say if I told you that your husband wasn't dead, <gasps> that he was very much alive? I'd say prove it. <laughs> look, I've got one or two photographs in this briefcase. I'd like you to take a look at them. But that's my husband. That's right. Well, when were these taken? In San Moritz, five days ago. Five? Days and ago. I can assure you they're genuine. But the photographer's name and date stamp are on the back. But that... What was my husband doing in Samaritz? And if he wasn't killed in that car accident, then why did he let me think he was? This is Milbourne. I can answer any questions you like about your husband. But first, I'd like to talk about something else. Well? I have a rather ambitious project in mind. I won't bore you with the details, but to get the project off the ground, I need about 5,000 pounds. Putting it crudely, you want me to give you... Oh, need we put it crudely? I have certain information about your husband. For instance, I can tell you where he is. In return for that information, I want 5,000 pounds. When, 
When would you want this money? I suggest you get it tomorrow morning and bring it out to the address on this piece of paper. Three Star Hotel, Bray on Thames, near Maidenhead. That's right. I'll see you there tomorrow morning, about 11.30. Is that okay? Well? All right. I'll be there. And for both our sakes, don't bring anyone with you. Just you and me and 5,000 pounds. Three Star Hotel, Bray on Thames, near Maidenhead. And you promise to see him tomorrow morning? Yes, about 11.30. 5,000 pounds seems an awful lot of money, Mrs. Milborn. I'm not worried about the money, Mrs. Temple. It's just that, well, I don't know whether he's telling the truth or not. I want to believe him because I really believe that Carl is alive. Tell me more about the photographs. He said he'd hand them over to me tomorrow morning. Do you think they were genuine? Was it your husband? Oh, yes, quite definitely it was Carl. Right. Now, this business can be handled without throwing £5,000 into Mr Clayton's lap. Yes, but how? I'll go down to Maidenhead myself tomorrow. I have a pretty shrewd suspicion that Clayton isn't a blackmailer. Not a professional one, anyway. As I see it, he wants to break away from Julia Carrington and badly needs money. And do you think he was lying about Carl? That we'll have to find out. Mrs Milborn, tell me, have you ever met or heard of a woman named Dolly Brazer? No, I haven't. Does the name Frida Sands mean anything to you? Why, yes. She's a great friend of my brother's. Oh. Did your husband know her? Yes, quite well. She occasionally supplied him with typists. Is she a friend of yours, Mrs Milborn? No, but we've met, of course. I should imagine Frida's friends are mostly men, preferably men who can put business in her way. But why are you interested in her? Your brother told her that you were consulting me. She could have passed that information on to someone else. Well, someone tried to kill my husband, Mrs. Milborn, and me. But surely... Yes, I... it's true. Uh, and you think that happened because... because I came to see you? Yes. Oh, dear. Mrs. Milborn, why do you dislike Frida Sands? I didn't say I disliked her. But you do, don't you? Well, if you must know, I mistrust her. I thought she had her eye on Carl. Carl used to laugh at me, but, well, a woman has an intuition about these things. Then is it possible that Miss Sands may know something about this affair, about your husband? Yes, I suppose it is. Anyway, you're going to help me, aren't you, Mr Temple? So far as Mr Clayton is concerned, yes. I'll phone you the moment we get back from Maidenhead. Thank you. I'll show you out, Mrs Milbourne. Oh, you're very kind, both of you. I do appreciate it, Mrs Temple, really I do. Paul? I'm trying to get hold of Vince Langham. The movie director? Hmm. Why do you want to talk to him? He once tried to lure Julia Carrington out of retirement. If he met her, then ten to one... He met Danny Clayton? Right. Mayfair 3925. Oh, could I speak to Mr Langham, please? I'm sorry, he's not here at the moment. I is that Mrs Langham? Yes. Oh, this is Paul Temple. Oh, hello, Mr Temple. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Is Vince in Hollywood? No. The Calendar Club? That's right. It's just off Lister Square. Well, this doesn't sound very much like Vince. What's that husband of yours up to these days? He's doing a musical for his sins. Right, cut! Cut! All right, everybody, take 20 minutes. 20 minutes! Everybody back in 20 minutes! <laughs> right. Can you spare me a minute, Vince? Good Lord! Paul Temple! Oh, what are you doing here? I looked in to have a word with you. Oh, delighted to see you, old man. Uh, George, coffee. Okay. I say, you've got quite a set up here. How long have you been on this epic? Oh, uh, four months. We're off the floor tonight, and on schedule, too. <laughs> well, sit down, Paul. Oh, thank you. Ah, well, how are you keeping? How's that wonderful little wife of yours? Oh, she's fine. Good. Vince, if I remember rightly, you went out to Switzerland a little while back to see Julia Carrington. That's right, I did. Oh, I had a wonderful vehicle for her. Unfortunately, I came up against that secretary of hers and oh, the little basket advised her against it. <laughs> the basket being Danny Clayton? Yeah, that's right. He's the person I want to talk to you about. 
Oh? Is he just her secretary, or...? <laughs> He's everything, as far as I can make out. He even does her thinking for her. Hmm. You know, Paul, this was a wonderful vehicle I had. Well, what was it, a play? No, no, a novel. Too Young to Die. Too Young to Die? Yes. Yeah. No, I've never heard of it. Oh, it's not out yet. It comes out next month. Oh. Who wrote this novel? A guy called Randolph. Richard Randolph. I've never met him. And it's going to be published next month, you say? Yes, I believe so. By whom? Oh, now you've got me. I can never remember names, especially publishers. I had a copy from a friend of mine who saw it early on and was convinced it was a cinch for Julia Carrington, and believe me, she was right. Who was this friend of yours? Frida Sands. Uh, her agency typed the novel, and that was how she came to read it. So you actually saw the typescript before the publishers? Yes. Oh, I know it's a bit unethical, but some of the biggest film deals have been fixed up that way. Have you still got an option on the book? Well, sort of. But tell me, why are you interested in Danny Clayton? I'm hoping to meet Julia Carrington, and I was wondering what I was likely to come up against. <laughs> are you trying to sell her anything? <laughs> Well, in a way, yes. Then you'll come up against Mr. Clayton, the little basket. Were you on the phone before we came out? I thought I heard you. Yes, I tried to get hold of Frida Sands, but she's away for a couple of weeks, on holiday. Where? Do you know? No, I spoke to the housekeeper. She wouldn't tell me. What time were you, Maidenhead? Oh, about 11.30. I forgot to ask you, how did you get onto the yard, Steve? Oh, I'm afraid I wasn't much help to them. Those photographs, there were scores of them. So confusing. Oh, Paul, what are you going to say to this man Clayton? Well, if he's just trying his hand at blackmail, I don't think I'll have much trouble in scaring the pants off him. Oh, you mean scare him into telling you what he knows about Carl Milborn? If he really knows anything. Oh, but what if he's a real crook? A professional? Then I'll play it off the cuff. I'll tell him I represent Mrs. Milbourne, and we might do a deal, providing he can give us more information. Yes, but supposing he wants to see the colour of your money? Oh, don't worry, dear. I'll think of something. Uh, what's that sign say? Um, Bray on Thames. Ah. Turn left, darling. Good. We're just in nice time. Oh, good morning. Are you the landlord? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Gad's the name, sir. Charles Gad. Uh, what can I do for you? I'm looking for a Mr. Clayton. I believe he's staying here. Uh, no, he was going to stay, sir. He had a reservation, but he dropped in this morning and cancelled it. Oh? Uh, you're not Mr. Temple, by any chance? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, Mr. Clayton said you'd be calling. Um, he left a note for you, sir. I've got it here. Ah, yes, sir. There we are, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, may we go into the lounge? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Make yourselves at home. Oh, thank you. Thank you. On earth could Danny Clayton have known that we were going to call here? Just a minute, Steve. Read it to me. Dear Mr. Temple, if you are interested in what happened to Carl Milbourne, I suggest that you meet me at Peter's Folly. This is a houseboat near Salter's Bend. I shall refuse to see you if you are accompanied by anyone. Danny Clayton. The word anyone is underlined. Salter's Bend, I, I think it's quite near. Now listen, Steve. Stay here until lunchtime. If I haven't come oh, back... Paul, you know I don't like that. I'd much rather come with you. No, I'd rather you stay, darling. If I'm not back by one o'clock, get in touch with Inspector Jenkins. He's the local chief down here. Tell him about Danny Clayton and the houseboat. Well, if that's what you want. Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, will you and Mrs Temple be staying for lunch? Uh, yes, we will, please. Tell me, Mr Gadd, do you know a houseboat called Peter's Folly? Oh, yes, of course. It belongs to Mr Peter Fletcher. Peter Fletcher. Mm, he's an artist, a very clever one too, I believe. Does he live on the houseboat? Mm, a part of the time, uh, but I think he has a flat in London too. Uh, the boat's moored at Salter's Bend, about two or three miles from here. Oh. How do I get there? You follow the main road for about a mile, then you'll see a turning, a Bidford Lane. Uh, you keep on down the lane for about half a mile till you get uh, sight of the river. Uh, that's Salter's Bend. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, just one moment. Uh, would you like a drink, Steve? Yes, I would. Gin and tonic, please. Gin and tonic? Certainly, madam. Now, don't worry, Steve. I'll be back in an hour. Probably less if Mr Clayton turns out to be a line shooter. Gin and tonic, madam. Oh, thank you. 
So you're the barman too this morning, Mr. Cad. <laughs> General manager, barman, receptionist. <laughs> uh, we have our staff problems like everyone else, I'm afraid. Yes, don't we all? Anyhow, the kitchen staff is at full strength, so I can guarantee you'll get a good lunch. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Temple. Certainly. Hello? Uh, no, he's just left. About two or three minutes ago. Yes, yeah, she's here. Uh, will you hold the line, please? Uh, Mrs. Temple, there's a call for you. For me? Uh, well, it, it was for Mr. Temple, but uh, when I said he wasn't here, they asked for you. Uh, who is it? Do you know? The gentleman didn't say, madam. All right. I'll take it. Hello? Mrs. Temple? Yes? Mrs. Temple, listen, this is urgent. Has your husband gone to the houseboat? Yes, he's just left. Well, go after him. Stop him. Tell him not to pick up the book. Not to pick up the book? Hello? Who is that? Hello? Is anything the matter, Mrs. Temple? I've got to get a taxi straight away, Mr. Gadd. Oh, I'm afraid there isn't a taxi around here, not for miles. Well, have you got a car? Yes, but I'm afraid I can't leave just now, Mrs. Temple. But I, I really must have a car. <laughs> is this really urgent? Yes, it is. I've got to get to my husband as quickly as possible. Okay, I'll get the car. Thank you. Uh, the garage is at the back of the hotel. It'll be quicker if we go this way. Sorry to stop you, sir. Would you mind telling me where you're going? What's the matter, Constable? Something wrong? I'd be glad if you'd answer my question, sir. Yes, <laughs> all right. I'm looking for a houseboat called Peter's Folly. I understand it's quite near here. I see. Now, could I have your name? Well, why do you want my name? I wasn't speeding on it. It's anything. for the inspector, sir. Inspector Jenkins? Yes, sir. Do you know him? Yes, I do. My name is Temple. Oh, uh, if you'll hold on a minute, Mr. Temple, I'll uh, tell the inspector... Oh, there seems to be another car behind. Oh, I'll stop them. Excuse me, sir. Steve, I told you to stay at the hotel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gadd. Okay, Mrs. Temple. Steve, what's happened? A man telephoned, and he wants to speak to you. He hmm. asked me if you were going to the houseboat, and when I told him you just left, he said, tell him not to pick up the book. Not to pick up the book? Yes. Is that all he said? Yes. Who was this man? I don't know, darling. He did give me his name. Oh, Paul, what's happening down there? It's a police hold-up of some kind. There's an ambulance. Oh, they're, they're carrying someone on a stretcher. Mr. Clayton? I don't know, Steve. Oh, anyhow, here's the inspector. Good morning, Mr. Temple. This is a surprise. Oh, good morning, Inspector. Steve, this is Inspector Jenkins. Oh, how, how do you do, do madam? Inspector? This is a bit off your beat, isn't it, Mr. Temple? I thought you spent most of your time in London, in the West End. Oh, we move around, Inspector. I was looking for a houseboat called Peter's Folly. Where are you now? Well, I've just come from there. Why were you looking for the houseboat? I had an appointment to see someone there. What's happened, Inspector? Has there been an accident? Hardly an accident, Mrs. Temple. Someone's been murdered. Hmm? Murdered? Yes. A man called Peter Fletcher. He's an artist. He owns the houseboat. Was your appointment with him? Uh, yes, it was. I see. What happened exactly? He was stabbed. And someone apparently crept up behind him while he was... But why were you visiting him? Was he a friend of yours? No. No, I wanted to see some of his paintings, that's all. Well, there's certainly plenty of pictures on the houseboat. Dozens of them. Do you think I could have a look round, Inspector? I'd rather you didn't. I've got a fingerprint man coming along. Oh, come, Inspector. Surely you can trust me not to leave any fingerprints about the place. All right. Just a quick look round. Thank you, Inspector. Wait here, Steve. I won't be long. You say Fletcher was stabbed? Yes. Hmm. Did you find the weapon? No. Probably at the bottom of the river by now. Who discovered the body? Oh, a woman in the next houseboat. The name of Harrison. She heard someone shouting, went to investigate. When was this? Oh, about an hour ago. Did she see anyone? No, unfortunately. Uh, by the way, Mr. Temple, didn't I see something about you getting your car pinched? Yes, you did. Now, that must have pleased you. <laughs> you must be losing your grip. <laughs> we all have our off days, Inspector. Ah, uh, here we are. Here's the houseboat. And careful, this plank's a bit slippery. I was not very impressed.
impressed by the inspector? Oh, Jenkins is all right. He's a bit of a sour puss, that's all. Anyway, as I was saying, Steve, the first thing I saw was the book. Mm -hmm. It was on the floor near the petition. When I saw the title, I nearly gave the show away. Well, what was it? Too Young to Die by Richard Randolph, published by Milbourne and Company. But I thought that the book wasn't out yet. It isn't. This was an advance copy. You know, that man on the phone knew exactly what was going to happen on the houseboat. Yes. And he was obviously a friend of yours. Ah, there's no doubt about that. If I'd seen that book, I'd have stooped down to pick it up, as I'm sure Fletcher did. You've... You've no idea who it was on the phone, Steve? No, I haven't. And yet, although I didn't recognize the voice, I had a feeling that I had heard it before somewhere. Recently? No, I don't think so. Well, think about it, Steve. It, it might come back to you. Where are we going now, Paul? Back to time? No, back to the hotel for lunch. Oh, I don't feel very much like lunch at the moment. No, I don't suppose you do, darling. But we can't let Mr. Gadd down. And in any case, I... Rather want to have another word with him. Was the lunch all right, sir? Excellent, Mr. Guy. Thank you. Excellent. Do sit down for a moment. Oh, thank you. I want to thank you for being so kind to my wife. <laughs> oh, I had no idea when Mr. Clayton said you'd be calling here that it would lead to so much excitement. <laughs> Mr. Guy, my wife and I have never actually met Mr. Clayton. Oh, really? Would you mind telling me what he looks like? Uh, well, he's a man of about 40, thick set, about 5 foot 8 or 9, dark, uh, swarthy, I suppose you'd call him. Got a very definite accent. Hmm. Had you ever seen him before? Uh, no. Um, he telephoned yesterday and made a reservation. Uh, then, early this morning, an American car pulled up and Mr. Clayton got out. He said he was very sorry he had to cancel his reservation and... Would I be kind enough to hand a letter over to a Mr. Paul Temple, who he thought to be asking for him later in the day? Hmm. And that was all? Yes. Oh, he offered to pay for the room. Oh, naturally, I wouldn't hear of it. Would you have said he was a good-looking man, Mr. Gadd? Good-looking? <laughs> Not by any standards, Mrs. Temple. Paul, this doesn't sound like the man Mrs. Milbourne saw. No. No, it doesn't, Steve. You no, know, you really are the limit, Paul. You'd never have your front door key with well, you. Well, what about you? Well, there's no point in my carrying a key if you've got yours. But I haven't got mine. Oh, come on, Charlie, come on, come oh, but on. He's probably on. taking a day off. Mm. Oh, it's you. Well, who did you think it was? The man from the football pools? <laughs> no such luck, sir. Everything all right, Charlie? Yes, everything's fine. I'll take your coat. Thank you. Oh, there's a gentleman to see you, Mr. T. Mm -hmm. He's in the drawing room. He called about half an hour ago. Insisted on waiting. I just couldn't get rid of him. Did he give you his name, Charlie? Yes. Uh, he's an American gentleman, sir. A Mr. Danny Clayton. And tomorrow we'll find out what exactly Danny Clayton is doing in the Temple's flat as the Geneva mystery continues. Hello again. Sitting comfortably. Good. Short Works. A season of murder, mystery and suspense. They've been driven out by the ghosts, she said. Can you credit it? From the Queen of Crime, Ruth Rendell. If she left him for another man, he would, of course, contribute something towards her support. But that something would be nothing to what she could skin him for if he left her. Read by Miles Jupp, Hattie Morahan and Samuel West. We have your wife. You'd pay anything to get her back, wouldn't you? Short Works. A season of murder, mystery and suspense on BBC Radio 4 Extra. Next Monday to Friday at 2.45. This week on BBC Radio 4 Extra, the singer Roger Whittaker shares his love for the wildlife of East Africa and Wales with Derek Jones, aided by recordings from the BBC Sound Archive in Sounds Natural. I think you're still a zoologist at heart, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, Roger, have you ever brought in any sounds of the wild in any of your recordings in recent years? As a matter of fact... Um, I don't know why, but I've always experimented with, with whistling noises, whistling sounds. Um, I, once I, I did cabaret in Glasgow once, it was more like a war, really. I, I, I knew by the, by the Monday night that I'd better do something a bit Scottish on the Tuesday, you know. Shen, goodbye.
Thanks, Neil. Good morning and welcome to BBC Radio 4 Extra, where we have advice on just about everything from solving crime to keeping a country estate going to pretending that you're still employed but aren't really. There's even a guide on how to murder your husband at ten, but thankfully it's very much tongue-in-cheek or perhaps poisoned pie in mouth. Then, as it happens, today's Radio 4 Extra producer is the podcast Radio Hour presenter. And so, to tell you what we can expect at 11, here's Laura Grimshaw. I'm going to be joined by uh, the really rather excellent Jake Yap, and we are going to be talking about comedy podcasts. Um, and rather excitingly, we managed to interview David Sidorov from The Onion, which is the American satirical website, and we'll be talking about A Very Fatal Murder, their podcast. And we also have a chat with the comedy writers Jason Hazley and Joel Morris, and we're talking about their podcast, Rule of Three. And uh, I think both of them are excellent, so you should probably listen at 11. Yes, I'm hooked already. All that at 11 with Laura Grimshaw, but now it's six o'clock in the morning on this Friday, the 11th of January. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Does anyone have a question? In a moment, in the mystery which swings between London and Geneva, Paul Temple discovers that Danny Clayton and Mrs Milbourne's stories don't tally as the suave sleuth investigates whether a dead man is really still alive. Then Sir Richard Fitzherbert of Tissington Hall talks to fellow historic house owners struggling to balance the books to keep their country estates going. The Baronet and Tissington's fight for survival is at 6.30 and at 7 there's comedy from Marlborough Road, Belfast in Two Doors Down. And now from 1965 it's time for the third episode of our Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery in which Danny Clayton is after reward money and finds an enforced channel crossing a threat. Episode 3, A Note for Danny. There's a gentleman to see you, Mr T. Oh? Uh-huh. He's in the drawing room. He called about half an hour ago. Insisted on ways and I just couldn't get rid of him. Did he give you his name, Charlie? Yes, he's an American gentleman, sir. A Mr Danny Clayton. Paul, stand here. You can see him in the mirror. Oh, yes. That's the man Mrs Milbourne saw. Not the man Mr Gadd described who gave him the note. Yes, this man's quite good-looking. Hmm. Come on, we better go in. Ah, Mr. Clayton. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Temple. Oh, good afternoon. This is my wife. Nice to know you, Mrs. Temple. Do sit down. Thanks. I do apologize for intruding like this, but I just had to see you. Oh? In fact, I've come all the way from Geneva for that very purpose. Just to see my husband? That's right, Mrs. Temple. I'm Julia Carrington's secretary. I guess you've heard of Miss Carrington. (laughs) Who hasn't? Yes. Well, she asked me to come over here to consult you. Just a moment, Mr. Clayton. How did you get my address? From Mrs. Milbourne? Mrs. Milbourne? Oh, I know. You do know Mrs. Milbourne. You mean the publisher's wife, Carl Milbourne? The man who was killed in a car accident? Yes. Yes, I know her. She telephoned me at my hotel just after I arrived. She telephoned you? That's right. You sound surprised. I am surprised. Oh? Would you mind telling me what happened, Mr. Clayton? Of course. It was just after I arrived. I checked into my hotel in New Wilton in Park Lane, and I was taking a bath when the phone rang. Oh, hell. Hello? Is that Mr. Danny Clayton? That's right. Mr. Clayton, I understand that you're Miss Carrington's secretary. Uh, Look, I'm taking a bath at the moment. Who is that? Uh, My name is Margaret Milbourne. Yes? Well, I think you met my husband when he was in Geneva a few weeks ago. Carl Milbourne. Oh, uh, was that the publisher who was killed in a car accident? Yes, that's right, except that... uh, Mr. Clayton, I'd like to have a talk with you. Well, look, I'm only over here for a couple of days and my schedule's pretty tight, Mrs. Milbourne. What is it you want to see me about? I can't tell you on the telephone. I I know you're a busy man, but I really would like to see you. Okay, I'll I'll see you downstairs in about an hour, in the cocktail bar. How's that? Oh, thank you, Mr. Clayton. I'll be there. I don't know why I said I'd meet her. I, well, I guess it was because she sounded so worried. 
And I was, of course, acquainted with her husband. You were? Yes, I met the poor devil when he was in Geneva. He wanted to see Julia because he thought she was writing her memoirs. Did Miss Carrington see him? No, I saw him. Julia refuses to have anything to do with publishers and journalists. It's my job to give them the brush off. I see. Is there any truth in the rumor that Miss Carrington's writing her life story? None whatever, Mr. Temple. And I told Carl Milborne that. I don't think he believed me, though. The interview wasn't exactly a pleasant one, I'm afraid. That's why I felt so sorry the next day when I read about the accident. Mm. What happened when Mrs. Milborne turned up at the hotel, if she turned up? Oh, she turned up all right. I was in the cocktail bar having a drink when one of the waiters came up to me. Excuse me, sir. Are you Mr. Clayton? That's right. Uh, that's Mrs. Milborne, sir, in the corner over there. Oh, I thank you. Excuse me, uh, Mrs. Milborne? Yes. Ah, I'm Danny Clayton. Oh, do sit down. Please. <sighs> Thanks. Well, uh, what is it you wanted to see me about, Mrs. Milborne? About my husband. I was very sorry to read about the accident. My husband isn't dead, Mr. Clayton. He isn't? No. But uh, I read a report on the inquest. Um, he was identified. Someone was identified, but... That wasn't my husband. It wasn't? No. Well, um, if you say so, Mrs. Melbourne, um, what can I do for you? I have a feeling that you might be able to help me. Your boss, Miss Carrington, saw my husband just before uh, he... No, Miss Carrington didn't see him. I interviewed him. Oh? Julia, Miss Carrington, that is, told me to tell your husband that she wasn't writing her memoirs. I gave your husband the message and he went away. Are you sure Miss Carrington didn't see him? Quite sure. She wouldn't dream of seeing a publisher or a newspaper man. Oh, I see. But uh, tell me, what makes you think it wasn't your husband who was killed in that accident? I... I've heard from him. You've heard from him? When? Several days ago. Uh, what happened? Did he phone you or... No, there was a message, a note... I found it in a hat he sent me. In a hat? Yes. He sent you a message in a hat? Yes. Why on earth should he do that? Oh, I, I don't know why I... Oh, Mr. Clayton, do you think I could have a drink? I, oh. I feel a little faint. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, waiter! Waiter! What can I get for you, sir? Bring this lady a brandy, please. After she had the brandy, I talked to her for about ten minutes, but I just couldn't get any sense out of her. She seemed, well, kind of crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Have you any idea what she was talking about? That message in a hat? Yes, I think I know what she was talking about. She's been very upset since she came back from Switzerland. Her brother's extremely worried about her. Boy, he's got my sympathy. Mr. Clayton, Mrs. Milbourne gave me a very different version of her interview with you. Oh? She said it was you who told her that her husband was still alive. What? She said you showed her some photographs of Carl Milbourne and that you offered the photographs and certain information for the sum of 5,000 pounds. Oh, that woman really is crazy. She said you asked her to take the money to the three-star hotel Brayon Thames. This is incredible. Did you go down there this morning? I certainly did not. I was in my hotel until 11 o'clock. Really? You can easily check on that, Mr. Temple, if you want to. Then I take it you've never heard of a man called Peter Fletcher or a houseboat called Peter's Folly? No, I haven't. Oh. This is only my second visit to London. I know very few people over here. In fact, I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for you. Why are you here? <sighs> Miss Carrington's received several letters, nasty letters, threatening blackmail, and she... she wants to talk to you about them, Mr. Mm. Temple. What's in these letters? I haven't seen them, but I gather they're pretty unpleasant. It certainly frightened poor Julia. Has she been to the police? That's the last thing she'd do. Why? Oh, if she consulted the police, that'd mean the newspapers, the lot. I see. When are you returning to Geneva? The day after tomorrow. And I've taken the liberty of making reservations for you and Mrs. Temple. Well, really, I think you might... Everything's taken care of. All you've got to do is say the word. All right, we'll come out with you. Thanks. Even if we fly back on the next plane. I've been wanting to have a chat with Miss Carrington, anyway. I've heard so much about her recently. Uh -huh. From whom? From a friend of mine, a film director called Vince Langham. Oh, yes, uh, Langham. <laughs> I understand you threw him out on his ear. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it as bluntly as that. 
He wanted Julia to make a film he had a novel he was crazy about. Did you or Miss Carrington read the novel? I've forgotten what it was. Oh, it's called Too Young to Die by Richard Randolph. Oh, no, we didn't read it. Julia's always getting these film propositions, and I always have the difficult job of turning them down. I hope I wasn't too rough on your friend. Well, Vince has a pretty thick skin. <laughs> I guess he has, or he wouldn't be in the film business. It's true. Well, I'll give you a call tomorrow morning and let you have the flight details. Good, thank you. I'll see you out. Good of you to call, Morris. Not at all. Would you care for a drink? Uh, no, thanks, Margaret. I rarely touch it these days. Uh, when I heard the bell, I thought it was Paul Temple. Temple? Well, he phoned this morning and said he wanted to see me. What about, you know? Well, I rather imagine he... Uh, yes, what is it, Mrs Rhodes? Mr Temple is here, madam. Oh, good. Ask him to come in. In here, please, Mr Temple. Oh, thank you. Oh, good morning, Mrs Milbourne. Good morning. Oh, hello, Lonsdale. Hello, Temple. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And thank you again for the loan of your car the other evening. Not at all. I'm glad I was able to help you. Do sit down, Mr Temple. Oh, thank you. Well, did you see Danny Clayton? Yes, I did, but not at Bray. Oh? He was waiting to see me when I got back to London. But he said he was going to Bray. He distinctly Before told me Before we go any he... further, Mrs Milbourne, I think I should tell you that Clayton's version of your meeting was quite different from yours. Different? I don't understand. Wait a moment, Margaret. Temple, my sisters tell me about her meeting with this man Clayton, about the photographs and about his asking for £5,000. Now, am I to understand that he denies the story? Clayton says he saw your sister at her own request. He claims to have made no demands whatsoever and says he knows nothing about the photographs. But that's not true. Look, Temple, I know my sister's been upset, perhaps even a little unbalanced at times, but... She wouldn't deliberately invent a story like that. People do strange things when they're under an emotional strain. Oh. That may be, but surely... If there's anything in your story that you want to retract, Mrs Milbourne, I shall quite understand. I don't wish to retract a single word of it. Very well. I'll get in touch with you the moment we get back from Switzerland. Then you've, you've definitely decided to help me. Yes, my wife and I are leaving for Geneva tomorrow morning. We're travelling with Mr Clayton. With Clayton? Mm -hmm. His story is that he came to see me on behalf of Julia Carrington... Apparently she's in trouble and wants to consult me. Yes, but the hat was sent from St. Moritz, Mr. Temple, we'll not We'll go Geneva. on to St. Moritz later. Now, don't worry. The moment there's any news, I'll get in touch with you. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, have you a photograph of your husband? You can let me have a fairly recent one, if possible. Yes, of course. Have you met Julia Carrington before, Temple? No, I haven't. I'm told she's a very difficult person to contact. Oh? A film director friend of mine tried to get in touch with her a little while ago, but failed. He wanted to interest her in a novel... A book called Too Young to Die. I seem to know that title. Well, I expect your husband mentioned it. Milbourne House is going to publish it. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Too Young to Die by... Now, what was the author's name? Richard Randolph. Oh, yes, of course. Randolph? But that was the name on the note that Carl sent. Yes. Is that a coincidence, Temple? That's one of the things I want to find out. Mrs. Milbourne, do you think you could get me a copy of the book? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'll have a word with Norman Wallace. Norman Wallace? He's the fiction editor at Milbourne House. Is he the man who used to work for the International Press? Yes, that's right. Oh, I've known him for years. I'll drop in on him this afternoon. Now, if you could let me have that photograph, Mrs. Milbourne. Well, what can I do for you? I hope this visit means you've decided to get yourself a real publisher at last. <laughs> Come off it, Norman. You know I can't leave Radley and company after all these years. No, no, I suppose not. But I always hoped Carl might have talked you into signing up with us. I was very sorry to hear about Carl Milbourne. Yes, it'll take us years to get over it. Carl and I were just forming a bunch of really promising new writers. You mean people like Richard Randolph? Yes, Randolph and one or two others. I saw something about Randolph in Books for All. Oh, uh -huh. It said his first novel was due out shortly and you had very high hopes of it. Well, we have. Too Young to Die was Carl's discovery. He had great hopes of it. Ah. You don't happen to have a spare copy by any chance. I'd rather like to read it. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, uh, uh, here we are. Too Young to Die by Richard Randolph. Oh, thanks. I'd be uh, interested to know what you think of it, Temple. And if you should feel inclined to say something nice about it, uh, preferably in print, of course. <laughs> Norman, you never give up. 
By the way, how many people have had advanced copies of the book, do you know? No, not quite as many as usual. We're being a bit cagey over this particular book. But I've got a list here if you're interested. Mm, I'm very interested. Oh, let's, let's see. Yes, here we are. Here's the list. Thank you. Apart from the usual critics and magazines, there are only two or three people outside the business. You didn't send a copy to an artist called Peter Fletcher? Peter Fletcher? No. But that name seems to ring a bell. Of course. The houseboat murder. Are you investigating the case? No, but it might be connected to something else I'm investigating at the moment. I see. Norman, tell me, is it true Vince Langham's interested in Too Young to Die in the film rights, I mean? Yes, it is. Oh, which reminds me, he's not on that list I gave you. He phoned me and asked for a copy of the book and I sent it round to his flat. Hmm. When did you send it? Uh, yesterday, I think. Did he say how he'd come to hear of the book? No, he didn't. But Vince Langham's one of the top directors in this country. <laughs> he's got his ear to the ground so far as anything new is concerned. Incidentally, he's quite a good writer himself, you know. Yes, so I understand. Ah, here's the coffee. Ah. I hope it's hot, Edith. Yes, it is, Mr. Horace. Oh, that'll be a nice change. <laughs> Paul! Paul, over here! Oh, hello, Prince. Well, I didn't know you frequented this den of iniquity. Yes. Well, what'll it be? I'll have a dry martini, please. Uh, two dry martinis, Fred. Uh, let's sit over there, Vince. In the corner. Well, let's go. Cheers. Have you finished the film? Well, we're off the floor, if that's what you mean. What happens now? Do you fly off to Jamaica with some glamorous blonde or other? <laughs> Me, with my tax troubles? Are you kidding? <laughs> Uh, the furthest I'll get is Geneva, and that's strictly business. Oh, what are you going to Geneva for? I'm going to have another shot at talking Julia Carrington into doing that film I was telling you about. Too Young to Die? Yes. I've just read the book again. The typescript? No, the book. I got an advanced copy from the publishers. Oh. You know, it's an absolute cinch for Julia. She couldn't go wrong in the part. But I thought she'd turned it down. Well, I never talked to her personally. I only saw that little creep who calls himself her confidential secretary. <laughs> Vince, tell me, have you ever come across the man who wrote Too Young to Die? Uh, Richard Randolph? Hmm. No, I haven't. I tried to get in touch with him. I wanted him to do a screenplay for me, but I just couldn't find him. Do you know him? No, I don't, but I'm interested in him. Oh, why? For a variety of reasons. <laughs> Such as? Well, I'm interested in him because there was a copy of his book on Peter Fletcher's houseboat. Peter Fletcher, the artist. That's right, the man who was murdered. The man who used to work for you, Vince. How did you know he worked for me? I looked him up in Who's Who. It said he designed several sets for you. Yes, he did. He was a very good designer. Then he suddenly decided to quit films and concentrate on <laughs> pure art, as he called it. <laughs> did you like him? No, I didn't. I thought he was a brilliant designer, but a conceited so-and-so. He knew the lot. I once had a flaming row with him. Yes, I know. Oh? Well, that wasn't in Who's Who. No. Who told you about it? One of my friends. That's right. <laughs> you say Fletcher had a copy of the book, and it was on the houseboat? Yes. But the book isn't out yet. How did he get hold of a copy? I don't know, Vince. I just don't know. Oh, hello, Steve. I've been worried about you, darling. Where on earth have you been? Well, that's nice, I must say. Hmm? And you call yourself a detective? What? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Your hair looks marvellous. Thank you. It took ages. I thought I was never going to get away. What have you been doing? I've been reading this. Oh, too young to die. Hmm. What did you think of it? I can understand what Vince means when he says it's a superb vehicle for Julia Carrington. She couldn't go wrong with it. Turn off the radio, don't you? Yes, Jim. Talking of Julia Carrington, I doubt if we shall get to Geneva tomorrow. It's terribly foggy. It's taken me 45 minutes to get from Hyde Park Corner. Oh, Lord. And the forecast isn't too good either. Fog's predicted again for tomorrow. Well, we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed. You haven't heard from Mr Clayton, I take it? No, I haven't. All right, darling, I'll take it. 
Hello. Paul, this is Vince. Oh, hello, Vince. Uh, am I disturbing you at dinner? No, 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 not at all. Look, I'm back at the flat and the most extraordinary thing has happened. Oh, what has? Well, you remember I told you I had a copy of that novel, an advance copy? Yes. Well, something's happened to it. It was in the top drawer of my desk, but it's not there now. You mean someone's taken it? Well, it's not there. It's vanished. You're sure it was in the desk? Yes, I'm quite sure. I distinctly remember putting it there. It's a damn nuisance because I wanted to take it out to Switzerland with me. Yeah. Well, if you ring Norman Wallace, he'll probably let you have another copy. Yes, I suppose I could do that. It makes me look a bit of a fool, though. No <laughs> nonsense. Anyway, thanks for the suggestion. Goodbye, then. Goodbye. Hmm? What was all that about? Vince Langham had a copy of Too Young to Die, and somebody's taken it. At least, he says they have. Is that all you rang up about? Mm -hmm. That's all. Paul, what is it? I was thinking about that book. I'm wondering if that was the one on the houseboat. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Temple. Hello. Oh, gee, what a terrible day. Isn't it? I hate fog. Have you been on to the airport? Yes, but no luck, I'm afraid. They seem to think it might last for days. Oh, dear. Hello, Clayton. Oh, hello. Well, how do you like our London fog? <laughs> you can keep it. I've just been using a little influence with an old friend of mine. I've got three sleepers on the 2.30 train from Victoria. Oh, we get clever. to Geneva tomorrow morning about half past eight. Ah, oh, I never thought <laughs> of the train. That's great. My friend sending the tickets round by hand. I told him we'd be in the dining room. Do you feel like a drink before lunch, Steve? I certainly do, darling. It's so depressing, this fog. Oh, me too, Steve. Uh, may I call you Steve, Mrs. Temple? Uh, yes, of course, Mr. Clayton. Oh, no, you must call me Danny. Did you manage to get a cabin, Paul? Yes, cabin B. This is the part I'm not looking forward to, Steve. Why, aren't you a very good sailor, Mr. Clay... Uh, Danny? Uh, I'll be okay, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes about an hour and a half as a rule. I guess I can hold out that long. Hello, Mr. Temple. Nice to see you again, sir. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Temple. Good afternoon. Have you a cabin, sir? Yes, cabin B. So, right this way, sir. Is it going to be a smooth crossing? Well... Yes, I, I think so, Mrs. Temple. You don't sound too sure. <laughs> Where have you been, Paul? On the top deck. There's quite a breeze now. Most of the fog's disappeared. Oh, good. Why don't you both come for a stroll? Well, I'm pretty comfortable lying down like this. I guess I'll stay this way if you don't mind. All right. How about you, Steve? Yes, I'd like a stroll. Will you be all right, Danny? Sure. You two go ahead. But we shan't be long. Enjoy yourselves, if you can. Ooh, it's pretty choppy. Yes, I hope Clayton's all right. Well, if he isn't, he'll want to be left alone. Yes. Do you feel okay, Steve? Uh, I, I think so. <laughs> Do you want to go back to the cabin? No, but, but I think I'd like a drink, a, a brandy perhaps. Yeah, good idea. The bar's down this way. Oops, oh dear, it certainly is rolling. Yes. Yeah, hold on to my arm. Mm. Paul, mm -hmm. do you see that man going down the companionway? No. Oh, I could have sworn it was Lonsdale. Morris Lonsdale? Yes. Well, let's go down and have a look. We can get to the bar that way. Well, there's no sign of Lonsdale, Steve. No. Well, I must have been mistaken. You're not usually mistaken, darling. Your eyesight's pretty good as a rule. Yes, I know it is, but I must have been wrong. Oh, dear. The bar looks very crowded. Mm, oh, don't worry. We'll find somewhere. Still pretty rough. How long do you think we've got to go? Oh, only about 25 minutes, that's all. Paul, hmm? there's Danny. He's obviously decided to come down after all. 
Timothy. He doesn't look too good, does he? He looks as if he's had a scare of some kind. Hi. There you are. Is anything wrong? No. I felt like a breath of fresh air, but when I got on deck, the boat started to roll. Paul, try and get him a brandy. Yes, of course. You sit down. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Making a fool of myself like this. Oh, I know exactly how you feel. I remember one year when Paul and I went to the States. The boat actually... Oh. Uh, oh, yes, well, that's another story. What happens when we get to Calais? We just get on the train, that's all. It'll be waiting by the side of the dock. Oh. Will there be time for me to kiss the ground? <laughs> Oh, this is our train. How do you feel now, Danny? I feel much better now I'm off that boat. <laughs> Everything's been taken care of, Mr. Temple. The luggage is on the train. Oh, thank you very much. Here you are, Stuart. Oh, thank you very much, sir. The attendant's waiting for you. Here we are, Coach D. This is it. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. May I see your ticket and passport, please? Mm, certainly. Merci, merci, monsieur. Uh, this way, please. Compartment 19 and 20. Does he keep the passports? Yes, we get them back tomorrow morning. Yeah, we are, sir. Double compartment 19, single compartment 20. Ah. Dinner will be served in about half an hour, sir. You'll hear the bell. It's fine. Uh, are there two sittings? Uh, yes, sir, but the second sitting is already full, I'm afraid. Oh, there must be a lot of people on this train. Uh, yes, we are full, sir. Every berth is taken. It is because of the English fog, you understand. Oh, we certainly do understand. Well, it certainly looks very comfortable. Uh, what happens now, Temple? Shall we meet for dinner in about half an hour? Yes, yes, in about half an hour. As soon as we're ready, Danny, we'll knock on your door. Fine. He still looks a little shaken. Yes, he does. And I'm not so sure it was the crossing either, Steve. What do you mean? You know when we were getting off the boat and I went back to the cabin? Yes, you said you'd left your gloves behind. I hadn't. I wanted to have a word with the steward. Why? I wanted to find out if anyone had visited Danny while we were taking our stroll. Well? The steward said he hadn't seen anyone. But just as I was leaving the cabin, I spotted a piece of paper in the waste paper basket. It was a note. Someone had obviously sent it to Clayton and he'd thrown it away. Well, what did the note say? Well, read it for yourself. Hmm. Written in block capitals. Be careful. You're too young to die, Mr. Clayton. Episode 4, A Change of Mind. You read it yourself. Oh, written in block capitals. Be careful. You're too young to die, Mr. Clayton. Who do you think sent this, Paul? Morris Lonsdale? It could have been, if it was Lonsdale you saw on the boat. Well, whoever sent it, Danny certainly took it seriously. Yes, it scared the pants off him. Oh, we're off. Mm, we better get ourselves sorted out. Give me that case, Steve. I'll put it over here. Well, it's been an excellent dinner, but oh, dear. I do feel sleepy. Why don't you go to bed now, Steve? Yes, I think I will. I hope you sleep well, Steve. See you tomorrow. Yes. Good night, Danny. Good night. <sighs> oh, gee, it suddenly hit me, too. <laughs> How long have you been over here, Clayton? Oh, Danny, please. All right, Danny. What, you mean in Europe? Yes. Oh, about five years. Where did you come from originally? Well, I was born in New York, but my people moved out to California about 20 years ago. Are your parents still there? Uh, no, both my folks are dead. Oh, I'm sorry. They lost their lives in a fire. A large apartment house was razed to the ground. Two of the old movie stars were killed. Twenty-two people lost their lives that night. What a terrible thing. Yeah, sure was. Fortunately, I was in the basement at the time talking to a friend of mine. I was one of the... Oh, one of the lucky ones. Oh, gee, I'm worse than Steve. I'm <laughs> yawning my head off. I'll get the bill. Oh, 
Oh, here we are, 19 and 20. Well, I'll say good night. Good night. Oh, hello. Steve's not here. But I thought she said... Oh, here she is coming oh. down the corridor. Hello. Oh. I met Mr. Lonsdale. We stood talking for a few minutes. Uh, Morris Lonsdale? Uh, Mrs. Milbourne's brother? Yes, that's right. Do you know him? No, no, I I've heard of him, that's all. He came out to Geneva when Carl Milbourne was killed. He's going out to St. Moritz. A friend of his has had a skiing accident. Oh? Oh, well, I guess I'll turn in. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Did Lonsdale say who this friend of his was that had the skiing accident? No, just said a friend of his had had an accident in St. Moritz, that was all. Couldn't get away from it, Paul. It was very pleasant. So it was Lonsdale you saw on the boat? Yes, it must have been. Paul, I thought Danny looked a little odd when I mentioned Lonsdale. Yes, yeah, so did I. Oh, oh Steve, you're tired. <laughs> I'll pop out into the corridor. Give me a shot when you're in bed. All right, darling. Uh, take care when you climb the ladder. Oh, you can have the top bunk if you like. No, thank you. <laughs> Second service. Second dinner. Second service. Second dinner. Hello, Temple. Oh, good evening, Lonsdale. I was wondering if I'd bump into you. I've already seen Mrs. Temple. Yes. I understand you're going to St. Moritz. Yes. A friend of mine, Miss Sands, has had a skiing accident. Frida Sands? Yes. Oh, of course, I spoke to you about her on the phone the other night. Yes, you did. Well, the body has broken her leg quite badly, I believe. I thought the train for St. Moritz went via Zurich, changing at core. This is the train to Geneva. Well, I, I've got some business to do in Geneva. I might even stay the night. Oh, I see. If you'll excuse me, Temple, I expect the dining car will be rather crowded. Yes, yes, of course. See you tomorrow, I expect. Good night. Good night. Paul? Oh. Yeah? Are you awake? Oh? Huh? What time are we due in Geneva? About uh, half past eight. Hope we're not late. Mm, I hope so, too. I've got an appointment at ten o'clock. An appointment? At the hotel? Yes. A man called Walter Nider's coming to see me. He's with the Zurich police. He's a friend of cigars. Well, why do you want to see Nider? Well, for one thing, I want to see the Swiss report on the Milbourne accident. But surely the best thing oh, would look, be... Oh, look, Steve, I'm tired, darling. Let's go to sleep. <laughs> All right, dear. Good night. Well, I hope you mean that. <laughs> someone moaning? Yes, I did. Is it Danny? Oh! Do you hear that? Yes. Mind your head, I'm coming down. Uh, Where's my dressing gown? On that hook. Oh, yes. I won't be a minute. Danny, are you there? Danny, are you all right? Who is it? Paul Temple. What is it, Paul? Are you all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Was that you we heard just now? Yeah, I, I, I slipped and bumped my head. Is there anything I can do? What did you say? Open the door, Danny. No, I, I'm okay. There's nothing to worry about. I, I'm okay. I'll see you at breakfast. Very well. Good night. What was the trouble? He says he slipped and bumped his head on something. Did you see him? No, he wouldn't open the door. Paul, a little while ago I heard angry voices. I'm sure one was Danny's, but I couldn't tell whose the other was. Well, I don't see what I can do. I can't force him to open his door if he doesn't want to. No, of course not. We'll just have to wait until morning. Danny? Who is it? Paul. Oh, just a minute. Hi, good morning. Oh, good... I say, that's a nasty eye you've got. Is it painful? <laughs> no, no, it's not as bad as it looks. What happened? Oh, well, I was getting into bed and the train gave one of those goddamn lurches and, and my case fell on top of me. 
was quite a wait. Uh, how's Steve this morning? Uh, is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. She has just gone along to breakfast. Will you join us? Uh, no, I'll skip it this morning, if you don't mind. Uh, the attendant's bringing me some coffee. All right, we'll see you later. Uh, where are you staying in Geneva? We're staying at the Bellevue. Ah, swell. I'll phone you later in the day after I've fixed up an appointment with Julia. She'll want you to come out of the house, I feel sure. All right, then. But look after that eye of yours. Have you finished unpacking, Steve? Yes, just about. Oh, good. Oh, we were lucky to get this room. Yes. It's lovely, isn't it? I love that view across the lake. Yeah. We'll go for a walk as soon as I have seen Walter Nida. Oh, I forgot about Nida. What time is he coming? Uh, he should be here any minute. Paul, don't you think that Danny Clayton looked a little uncomfortable this morning? <laughs> I expect he felt it with that enormous bruise on his face. Uh, no, I don't mean that. I mean, he seemed, well, almost frightened to look you in the eye. He looked embarrassed. Yes, I know what you mean. I asked him about the arrangements, and he said he was going to phone you as soon as he got to Julia Carrington. Yes, we're supposed to be going out to her house this evening. Oh, ah, this is probably Nida. Yes. Ah, oh, hello, Mr. Nida. Come on in. Thank you. Uh, I don't think you've met my wife. No, I have not had that pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Temple? How do you do, Herr Nida? I've often heard Sir Graham Forbes speak of you, Mrs. Temple. Oh, Sir Graham and I are old friends. I saw him a couple of days ago. He's looking remarkably well. I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, Sir Graham told me that you are interested in the Milbourne accident, Mr. Temple. Yes. He thought perhaps I might be able to help you. If you will. Well, what can I do for you? I'd like to hear your version of the accident. What exactly happened? And it's quite simple. Carl Milbourne stepped off the pavement without looking and was knocked down by a car. He caught his foot in the bumper and was dragged face downwards for a considerable distance. Oh, how dreadful. Yes, it was a very nasty accident, Mrs. Temple. But not, I assure you, the fault of the driver. The man was completely exonerated. And there was no question as to the identity of the dead man? None whatsoever. They established his identity beyond any doubt. Besides, Mrs. Milbourne and her brother, Mr. Lonsdale, both identified the body. Yes, but Mrs. Milbourne has since changed her mind. But changed her mind? Yes, she's now convinced that it wasn't her husband who was killed. But uh, this is absurd, surely. Did she explain why she had changed her mind? Yes, apparently her husband bought a hat from a shop in St. Moritz. His old one was posted back to London. Inside the lining of the hat was a note. Yes, it was in uh, Carl Milbourne's handwriting and was written two days after the accident. And what did the note say? Well, as far as I remember, it said, Please don't worry. Have seen Randolph. Everything will be all right. We'll get in touch later. Ah, now I understand what you are doing in Switzerland, Mr. Temple. I take it you are going to Sam Moritz to question the people in the hat shop? Yes, eventually. But I have another reason for being here. Oh, Julia Carrington wishes to see me. But not about the Milbourne affair, surely? No, no, it's something quite different. Do you know Julia Carrington, Herr Nida? Everyone knows Julia Carrington, Mrs. Temple. But she's not a friend of mine, if that's what you mean. In fact, I've only seen the lady once. She keeps herself very much to herself, you know. When did you see her? Recently? On January the 5th. You remember the date? Very well. It was my wife's birthday. Ah. <laughs> It was also the day after the accident. Yes. Yes, that's right, it was. How very odd. I, I hadn't realised that. Mr Nider, tell me, does the name Richard Randolph mean anything to you? No, I don't think so. He's an author. He's written a book called Too Young to Die. It comes out next month, I believe. No, I've never heard of him or the book. Should I have done? No, 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 it doesn't matter. It's not important. Now, I don't believe that, Mr. Temple, or you wouldn't have mentioned the name. You've aroused my curiosity, my friend. However, if you feel I can help you in any way, do not hesitate to phone me or drop in the office any time. Thank you. You'll regret this. I'll probably pester the life out of you. <laughs> any friend of Sir Graham's is a friend of mine. Uh -huh. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. I do hope we shall meet again. I hope so, too. I'll come down with you. I shan't be a moment, darling. Hello? Oh, Steve? Yes, who is that? Oh, this is Danny. Oh, hello. Can I have a word with Paul? He's not here just at the moment. Oh, well, would you tell him I've spoken to Julia and she'd be pleased if you'd both come out of the house this evening, around six o'clock. Oh, good. 
I'll pick you up at the hotel at about 5.30, okay? Yes, we'll be waiting for you. I'll see you then. Goodbye, Steve. Goodbye, Danny. Well, here we are, Steve. Oh. This is the place I told you about. I was beginning to think that it didn't exist. <laughs> well, you said you wanted to walk. Oh, yes, but you walked me off my feet. <laughs> Uh, what would you like to drink? I should like a long drink. I'd like a nice, cool, dry wine. Right. Did you say that we'd been here before? Yes, don't you remember? About four years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a very good restaurant through there. Ah. Uh -huh. We can have lunch here, if you like. I like. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to walk another inch. Well, if you want to keep your figure, you... Good Lord. Look who's just come in. Vince Langham. Well, well, well. It's a small world. Hello, Paul. Hello. Oh, nice to see you again, Steve. Hello, Vince. Well, when are you going to see Julia Carrington? <laughs> as soon as I saw you, I said to myself, well, there's one person who knows why I'm here. I'm seeing her tomorrow morning. You are? Yes, I phoned her the moment I arrived and was lucky enough to get the great lady herself. Really? When I told her who I was, I must say she was pretty friendly. Quite different from that creep Danny Clayton. Uh, she's giving me half an hour tomorrow morning. Do you think you'll sell her the idea of a comeback in half an hour? Well, if I can persuade her to read the book, yes, definitely. Is that too young to die? Yes, have you read it? No. Oh, it's a great book and a wonderful part for Julia. There's no doubt about that. I take it you managed to get another copy, Vince. Another copy? Yes, you told me on the phone that your copy of the book had been stolen. Oh, so I did. No, I was mistaken. I'd left it in the drawer by the side of the bed. Anyway, I found it. Uh, I say, aren't you two drinking? Uh, I was just going to get Steve a drink. What would you like? No, no, let me do No, it. no, no, please. Oh, well, I'd like a dry martini, Good. please. Two dry martinis and some wine. When did you arrive in Geneva? This morning. Came by train. My plane was cancelled because of fog. If Miss Carrington does agree to make a comeback, when would you start the film, Vince? Uh, that's a difficult one to answer. It would take six months to get a shooting script and, well... Then there's all the finance to arrange. Oh, take a year, I reckon. Well, I wish you luck. Thank you. You're certainly sold on the subject. I'll say that for you. Oh, it's a great story. Corny as hell, but just right for Julia Carrington. Well, what's it all about, Vince? Well, what kind of story is it? It's about a small-town girl who becomes a Hollywood star. She turns into a dipsomaniac, and one night... Vince, she... give me a hand. Oh, excuse me. I think Paul needs some help. Uh, coming, old boy. Surely this isn't the main road. No, it's a shortcut. Ooh, it looks a very dangerous road, right by the side of the lake like this. Oh, don't worry, folks. I know this road like the back of my hand. I must have driven along it a thousand times. Was Miss Carrington surprised when she saw you? A surprise? How do you mean? I mean, by your face, the bruise. Oh, yeah. She wondered what on earth had happened. I don't think it looks as bad as it did, though, do you? No, I don't think it does. How did you find Miss Carrington? I found her in rather a curious mood. I asked her if she'd received any more threatening letters, and, well, she just refused to discuss the subject. Uh -huh. And yet, before I left for London, she was in quite a state. That's why I consulted you, of course. Now, well, oh, I don't know. She still seems worried, but, well, more resigned, I guess. How old is she, Danny? <laughs> that is the $64,000 <laughs> question. My who's who says she's 46. Yeah, well, with all due respect, your who's who isn't exactly with it. Oh. My guess is that she's 52, but she looks 38. I'm going to hate this woman. <laughs> <laughs> We've arrived, Julia. Here's Mr. and Mrs. Temple. How very nice to see you both. <laughs> Mr. Temple, I've heard so many things about you. Oh, nice things, I hope. Always nice things. <laughs> this is a pleasure. It really is. Thank you very much. Mrs. Temple, let me take your coat. Yeah, I'll take it. Oh, thank you. I hear you had quite an eventful journey. Well, it might have been worse. Oh, not for Danny. Fancy putting your suitcase so it could fall on you. Well, sleepers are different over here. They're not like the ones back home. Now, no excuses, Danny. Oh, Mrs. Temple, would you like to see the house first while your husband and I have our little chat? Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, come along, I'll take you around, Steve. I Thank think you'll find it interesting. Thank you, I'm sure I shall. Take her to the library first, Danny, and show her the Matisse. Sure, I'll show her the lot, Julia, the works. Come along, Steve.
Mr. Temple, I owe you an apology, and I just don't know how to begin. An apology? Well, I sent Danny all the way over to London just to see you, and, well, as it turns out, it was quite unnecessary. Oh. I understood from Mr. Clayton that you'd received some particularly nasty letters and you were being threatened with blackmail. Yes, that's true, but, well, Danny does tend to exaggerate a little. That's the trouble. However, there's nothing for you to worry about, Mr. Temple. I'll pay your fee, of course, and all your expenses. Miss Carrington, I'm not interested in the financial aspect of this affair, and I'm not worried. But I would like to know why you were worried in the first place and why you thought of consulting me. I received several very unpleasant letters... Well, naturally, I was worried I didn't know what to do. But yesterday morning, quite by accident, I discovered that the letters were written by a man who used to work for me. I threatened him with the police, and he came and apologised. Oh, it was as simple as that. Yes. I'm terribly sorry. I do feel guilty dragging you and your delightful wife all the way here. Oh, there's nothing for you to feel guilty about, Miss Carrington. We were coming to Switzerland anyway. Oh, I'm glad. You've set my mind at rest. I'm going to St. Moritz to make inquiries about a man called Carl Milborn. I expect you've heard of him. Milborn? Hmm. He was killed in a car accident in Geneva. Of course, I remember now. I read about it. A publisher, an Englishman. That's right. I understand he visited you just before he was killed. Yes, I believe he did, but I didn't see him. The poor man thought I was writing my memoirs. Oh, dear, the times I've had to contradict that ridiculous rumour. There's no truth in it. I wouldn't dream of putting pen to paper or voice to tape recorder <laughs> or whatever it is one does these days. But it's no use, you know. I just can't convince people I really do want to be left alone. I'm always being pestered by newspapers and publishers and... Film people? Yes, they're the worst. They really are the worst. Then why do you bother to see them? I never see them. Danny takes care of all that nonsense for me. Oh. Will he take care of Vince Langham tomorrow morning? Vince Langham? Who's Vince Langham? He's a movie director. A friend of mine. I understand you're seeing him tomorrow morning. Did Danny tell you that? No, Langham did. What? He said he phoned you and you agreed to see him. He wants to talk to you about Too Young to Die. But this is nonsense. I haven't talked to a movie director in years. Too Young to Die? What is that, a play? A book. I've never heard of it. And I've never heard of Vince Langham, or whatever he calls himself. It is Vince Langham. I'm sorry the visit was a waste of time, Temple. Oh, it wasn't a waste of time. Don't worry about it, Danny. And keep your eyes on the road. It's awfully dark tonight. Yes, it is. But it's always dark down by the lake. I told you I had a funny feeling about Julia. When I got home this morning, I felt that... Well, she'd changed her mind about you. Did you actually see the letters, Danny, or did Julia just tell you about them? She showed them to me, but she wouldn't let me read them. Gee, I wish we had gone back the other way now. This road's pretty dicey. Yeah. How long has she lived in Switzerland, Danny? About four years. She originally bought a house in the south of France and then decided to... Hey, what's that like? Slow down. Is it a car? Yes, it is. A, a very large one. Slow down. Danny, be careful. For heaven's sake, get over. Look out, we're coming to a bridge. He's forcing you over, Danny. We're going over. <laughs> to the car. Oh. <clears throat> you you make for the bank, Steve. Yes. I'll I'll get it. Oh. I'll swim. Paul. I'm, I'm coming, Danny. Hold on. Oh. I, I tried to reach you. 
here, but... Oh. Oh. Now, now relax. <laughs> relax, Stanley. You'll, you'll be all right. Get out of here. Don't, don't struggle. I don't struggle, Pam. I've got you. You'll be all right. Well, Doctor? Uh, you have nothing to worry about, Mr. Temple. Your wife doesn't seem to have suffered any ill effects. Of course not, Paul. I'm perfectly all right. May I get up, Doctor? <laughs> yes, if you wish to, Mrs. Temple. Oh, uh, tell me, Herr Neider, uh, how did this accident happen? Well, is that something we're trying to find out, Doctor? Anyway, I'm glad Mrs. Temple's all right. I'll take you downstairs. Uh, no, 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 there's no need. Uh, I have another patient to see in the hotel on the fourth floor. Uh, Mrs. Temple, I'll leave these tablets for you just in case you can't uh, get to sleep tonight. Um, take one just before you go to bed. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Good night, Doctor. Uh, good night, Mr. Temple. Well, my friends, you certainly had a lucky escape. Yes. Uh. Did the ambulance take Danny Clayton to the hospital? No, he recovered consciousness and insisted on going home. And how is he, do you know? We haven't had a report yet. We've been too busy trying to trace the other car, Mrs. Temple. But I'll ring his home later tonight and get in touch with you. Thank you, Nida. We do appreciate your help. We both appreciate it very much. Nonsense. You are friends of mine. Nice. Excuse me. Hello? Is that Mr. Temple speaking? Yes? This is Julia Carrington. Oh, hello, Miss Carrington. I was anxious about you and your wife, Mr. Temple. Danny's told me about the accident, and I was wondering if there was anything I could do. No, no, we're perfectly all right, thank you. But what about Danny? How's he? Oh, he's feeling very much better, and he's most grateful to you. He'll phone you himself tomorrow morning and tell you just how grateful he is. Oh, I'm glad he's recovered. Give him my regards. I will indeed. Mr. Temple, I'd like to thank you, too. I'm, I'm terribly grateful. I just don't know what I'd do without Danny. Well, if you're so fond of him, Miss Carrington, do me a favour. Yes? Tell him to take swimming lessons. <laughs> Myself. Yes, do. Goodbye. Well, she certainly sounded grateful. I suppose that's something coming from Julia Carrington. It is indeed. <laughs> well, Mrs. Temple, I'll say good night. I'm so glad you're none the worse for your adventure. Thank you, Herr Nida. If there's anything else I can do, please let me know. Thank you. I'll come down with you. We're leaving for St. Moritz tomorrow, staying at the Grisant House Hotel. So if you should want to get in touch with us. Hello? Mrs. Temple? Yes? Hold the line, please. There's an outside call for you. Oh, who is it, Steve? I don't know. I've just picked it up. It's an outside call. Oh, all right, darling. I'll take it. Hello? Go ahead, please. Is that Mr. Temple? Yes, who is that? This is Margaret Milbourne. Oh, where are you speaking from, Mrs. Milbourne? I'm in Geneva. Geneva? Yes, I arrived this afternoon. Mr. Temple, I've got to see you. It's very important. Oh, very well. Do you want to come round here to my hotel, or no, shall I... I can't do that. I'm speaking from a phone box. It's in a restaurant called Chez Maurice. Oh, I know the Chez Maurice. It's opposite the Quai des Bergues. Yes, that's right. Please come here, Mr. Temple, straight away, if you can. All right, I'll be there in 15 minutes. I'm so glad you could come. It's kind of you. Do sit down, please. Are you all right, Mrs. Milbourne? Oh, yes, I, I'm perfectly all right, but I've had quite a day. How did you know where we were staying? I, I don't remember Paul telling you. I knew you were in Geneva, so I rang up all the big hotels and... Mr. Temple, I told you my husband was alive, didn't I? You said you thought he was alive. Well, I was right. He is. How do you know he's alive, Mrs. Milbourne? I've spoken to him. In the fourth episode of Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery, Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. Production for the BBC was by Martin Seward. So what exactly does the mysterious Mr. Milbourne deceased or possibly not have to say to his wife? Well, more on that in the penultimate episode of this Geneva Mystery at the same time tomorrow. Desert Island Discs Revisited on BBC Radio 4 Extra. My castaway this week is the writer James Elroy. 
I carry my thoughts about with me for a long time before writing them down. I turn my ideas into tones that resound, roar and rage until at last they stand before me in the form of notes. Now, I'm sure that you recognise that as Beethoven. Yes. Um, I think it seems to chime with the creative yes. life that you have led. Yes, yes. My favourite Beethoven quote, and it's the epigraph for the Hilliker Curse, is, I will take fate by the throat, which is what Beethoven said when he began to go deaf. What is it about Beethoven that, that speaks to you, that is so important to you? He is the voice of God. He is the most unfathomable genius ever created by civilization. Sometimes I think there is only him and me, and that he speaks to me personally. Beethoven was always writing for his immortal beloved. Quite often when someone asks me, why do you write? I quote Dylan Thomas's From London, we present the Francis Durbridge serial, Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery. Episode 5, A Surprise for Mrs. Milbourne. Mr. Temple, I told you my husband was alive, didn't I? You said you thought he was alive. Well, I was right. He is. How do you know he's alive, Mrs. Milbourne? I've spoken to him. You've actually spoken to your husband? Yes, this morning in London. The telephone bell rang and the operator said there was a personal call for me from Geneva. It was Carl. Are you sure? I'm absolutely sure. He, he sounded tense and worried, but it was Carl. What did he say? He told me to catch a plane and meet him here at this restaurant tonight at nine o'clock. But it's, it's now quarter past ten, Mrs. Milbourne. Yes, I know. I've been waiting since 8.30. About half an hour ago, I decided to try and find you and Mrs. Temple. I telephoned four hotels before I found you. Have you told your brother about the phone call? No, he left for St. Moritz yesterday by train, before the fog lifted. You might have got in touch with him here in Geneva. But Morris isn't in Geneva. Oh, yes, he is. We met him on the train coming here. He said he had some business here before he went on to St. Moritz. But he told me he was going straight there. I can't imagine why he... Uh, Mr. Temple? Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was just looking at someone. Steve, isn't that Vince over there? Where? With the dumb blonde. Oh, yes, it is. Is he a friend of yours? Yes, Vince Langham, the film director. Oh? Curious enough, he's come over here to see Julia Carrington. He wants to interest her in that book I spoke to you about, Too Young to Die. But I thought Julia Carrington had retired. She has, but Vince is the persistent type. I'd better go and have a word with him or he'll be bouncing over here. Excuse me, Mrs. Milbon, I won't be a minute. Vince. Oh, hello, Paul. Is this what you call strictly business? Oh, I'm trying to get the local colour, old boy. Yes, I think you've got it. I, um, I can't introduce you. She doesn't speak a word of English. She doesn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I came over to wish you luck with Julia Carrington tomorrow. I have a feeling you'll need it. What do you mean? I saw her this evening. She denies having spoken to you. What? I have a nasty feeling she won't see you tomorrow, Vince. Oh, it's that secretary of hers. He's made her change her mind, the little creep. All I know is... All I know is she made an appointment with me and she's damn well going to keep it. Well, I hope you're right. Good luck, Vince. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to shoot my mouth off like that. Well, thanks for the tip. I'll know how to play it tomorrow morning anyway. Paul, it's after 12. Don't you think we ought to be making a move? Well, that's up to Mrs. Milborn. No. No, your wife's right, Mr. Temple. It's obvious Carl's not coming, or he'd have been here by now. Excuse me, madame. Are you Mrs. Milborn? Yes. You are wanted on the telephone, madame. Oh. oh, who is he calling? The gentleman didn't give his name, sir. He's calling from St. Moritz. Where can I take it? There's a box over there, madame. Oh, Mr. Temple, please come with me. Yes, yes, of course. Wait here, Steve. Yes, all right. This way, madame. It's all right. I'll close the door. Hello? Hello? Who is that? Who? 
this is Mrs. Milbourne speaking. Margaret, this is Carl. Oh, Carl. Where are you? I've been waiting for you. I'm sorry, Margaret, but I had to come out to St. Moritz. Oh, Carl, what's this all about? When am I going to see you? Margaret, I want you to go back to London. What? I'll get in touch with you there as soon as I can. But, Carl, you just can't leave me like this. You, you've got to tell me why. Carl. Carl, are you there? He's gone. Was it your husband? I think so. It, it, it wasn't a very good line, but... Oh, yes, of course it was Carl. He wants me to go home. Are you going? Oh, I don't know. I, I just don't know what to do, Mr. Temple. <laughs> More coffee here, Nida? Uh, no, thank you, Mrs. Temple. Oh, I had that phone call traced, Temple. It was from a phone box. Ah, I thought as much. You know... I can hardly credit that Milbourne is alive. After all, Mrs. Milbourne and her brother identified the body. Yes, but it was badly disfigured. Even so. Uh, tell me, is Mrs. Milbourne going to St. Moritz with you this morning? She keeps changing her mind, poor woman, but I think she'll come with us in the end. What time do we get there? Not until late tonight, about uh, 11.15. 23.20, to be exact. And don't be surprised if you come across two friends of yours... Friends of ours? Miss Carrington and Danny Clayton. Are they going to St. Moritz? Uh, yes, uh, Julia Carrington has a villa there. But uh, how do you know they're going there? Well, I went to see Miss Carrington last night after I'd seen you and Mrs. Temple. She was making a great fuss of her secretary, mm -hmm. who, by the way, seemed to have made a very quick recovery. She suggested they had two or three weeks in St. Moritz, and Mr. Clayton jumped at the idea. Mm. Did Clayton help you at all? Could he throw any light on the accident? Well, he was cooperative, but there was very little he could tell us. Oh. Uh, where are you staying in St. Moritz? At the Grisson House Hotel. Ah, good. I'll tell a colleague of mine, Hans Schmidt, to contact oh, you. Thank you. And I'll send him the photographs you gave me of Carl Milborn. Thank you. Oh, and there's something else I'd like you to do for me, if it isn't too much trouble. Why, of course. When you get back to your office, perhaps you'll be kind enough to phone our mutual friend, Sir Graham and ask him if he could find out. Still shaving, Steve. I shan't be long. Lord, you're dressed. You're bright and early this morning. Well, I'm early. I don't know about bright. I didn't sleep very well. No, it's the altitude. You'll get used to it in a day or so. I hope so. Steve, I'm going down to that hat shop as soon as we've had breakfast, but I don't want Mrs. Milbourne tagging along. Mm -hmm. Would you take her skating or something? <laughs> she doesn't look the skating type to me. Well, then take her up to the ski slopes and let her watch the skiing for an hour or so. Yes, all right. Ah, that'll be her now. I'll get my dressing gown on. But I thought it said we'd meet her downstairs. Good morning, Temple. Oh, hello, Lonsdale. Come in. I didn't expect you. I thought it was your sister. Good morning, Mrs. Temple. Good morning. Uh, I saw Margaret downstairs. She told me you were here. Uh, forgive me for intruding, Mrs. Temple, but I wanted to have a word with your husband. Yes, of course. I didn't know you were staying at this hotel. I didn't know you were, either. We arrived last night. Temple... Margaret's just told me about those phone calls, the one in London and the one in Geneva. Could it have been Carl on the phone? Your sister certainly seemed to think so. Then he, he really is alive after all, and he's here in St. Moritz. So it would seem. I just can't believe it. Tell me, Lonsdale, had your brother-in-law any worries, financial worries? Oh, no more than most businessmen, I imagine. At one time, his publishing firm was having a tough fight, but I understand they're well out of the wood now. So you don't think he'd be likely to, well, fake the accident and then disappear? Good heavens, no. It has happened, Mr. Lonsdale. Yes, well, I'm sure it hasn't happened in this case, Mrs. Temple. If Carl had been desperate, he'd have come to me or one of his friends. Did he ever borrow money from you? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did about six years ago. Oh, oh well, it's safe enough. I'm not worried. 
I say, do you mind if I join you and Margaret for breakfast? No, 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 of course not. Uh, we'll go down, Paul, and then you can finish dressing. Yes, all right. Have you any news of your friend, Miss Sands? Frida, yes, I'm afraid the news isn't too good. I thought it was just a broken leg, but she slipped a disc as well. Oh. The poor darling's in a great deal of pain. Have you seen her? Uh, not yet, but I'm going to the hospital this morning. See you downstairs, Temple. Yes, all right, I won't be long. Hello? Paul? Speaking. Uh, this is Danny. Oh, hello, Danny. How are you feeling? Well, I'm okay now, thanks to you. <laughs> Have you started those swimming lessons yet? Well, not yet, but they're on the agenda. Oh, good. Where are you speaking from? I'm in San Moritz. Julia and I flew here yesterday. Flew? Yes, there's a small airport here, and Julia's got a private plane. Really? We'd like you and Steve to come out here to lunch today, if that's possible. Oh, thanks. We'd like that. Good. Well, we'll expect you about one o'clock. Oh, I'd better give you the address. Oh, yes. It's the Villa Serbolini. Villa Serbolini? Yeah, it's very well known. Your concierge will tell you how to get here. Take a sleigh. It's a lovely ride on a day like this. Yes, we'll do that. Good. See you later. All right. Goodbye, Danny. Timothy, you've been holding out on me. I didn't know you could skate like that. Oh, oh. let's sit down. Yeah. I'm exhausted. Uh, put mm. this rug over you. Thank you. Well, did you go to the hat shop? Yes, but it's not just a hat shop. They sell everything. Clothes, sports equipment, the lot. Well, the sort of place where you could spend a fortune. Mm. And do you know who was spending a fortune? No. Vince Langham. I didn't know he was in St. Moritz. I thought that he... Is he following us, or are we following him? That's exactly what Vince said. But what's he doing here, Paul? Julia Carrington refused to see him in Geneva, so he followed her here. But let me tell you about the hat. Mm -hmm. I saw the manager of the shop, a pleasant little man called Cromer, and he invited me into his office. I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Temple. Thank you. I've read several of your books. Oh, I'm glad you survived. <laughs> Mr. Cromer... I'm making certain investigations, and I think you might be able to help me. I will if I can. About a month ago, a man named Carl Milbourne bought a hat from you and asked for his old hat to be posted back to his address in London. I have no knowledge of the transaction myself, but there's probably some record of it in the hat department. Do you think I could have a word with the assistant concerned? Unfortunately, that isn't possible, Mr. Temple. Uh -huh. At that time, the assistant in the hat department was an Italian girl who has since left. Mm, pity. But wait a moment. I'm beginning to recall the transaction now. Ah. The assistant came and asked me if it was possible to post your friend's hat to England. She asked me to have a word with him. I remember thinking the man looked ill and rather nervous. Mr. Croner, I'd like you to take a look at these photographs. Uh, certainly. Do you recognize the man? <laughs> I see so many people. Yes, I'm sure, but perhaps... No, I'm sorry. I couldn't say for certain that this is the man. But wait a moment. As I remember it, your friend wasn't alone. He was with a party of people. Uh, am I right? Well, it's possible, I suppose. You mean a large party? No, no, just a small group of tourists. They were all in the shop laughing and joking. Did you see them speak to him? Ah, that I can't remember. But I certainly had the impression that he was with them. Thank you, Mr. Croner. You've been extremely helpful. Not at all. Uh, Mr. Temple, is there anything I can show you while you're here? Well, that doesn't seem to have got you very far, Paul. On the contrary. You think that Carl Milbourne was with the party of people? I think it's possible that the man who bought the hat was trying to avoid attention by tacking himself on to a group of tourists. But Mrs. Milbourne's positive that it was her husband's hat and that the note was written by him. Mrs. Milbourne's a very good actress, Steve. She always was. Are you suggesting... I'm not that... suggesting anything. Good Lord, it's quarter past twelve. You'd better start changing. I've ordered a kutcher for half past. A kutcher? Oh, by Timothy, you are ignorant. Slay the... Oh! Slay. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Temple? Mm-hmm? There's a telephone message for you, sir. Oh, thank you. Who's it from? Danny Clayton. The lunch is off. Oh, dear. Apparently, Julia Carrington isn't well. Oh, and I was so looking forward to that sleigh ride. 
Well, we'll go for a ride anyway and have lunch in Pontresina. Good, that's a wonderful idea. Oh, uh, help me off with these skates, Jack. Are you warm enough, Steve? Yes, I'm fine. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? Mm. I like your kucha. <laughs> Doesn't the snow look lovely on those trees? Yes. Must have been snowing for weeks. Mm. Oh, smell the pine trees. Mm. I'll remind you of this when we get back to foggy old London. <laughs> There'll be no need to remind me. How long will it take us to get to Pontesina? Oh, you'd better ask Ferdy. He knows his horses better than I do. Ferdy, how long will it take us to Pontresina? Not very long, ma'am. I think about 20 minutes, 25, perhaps. The snow is very good. It is easy today. Oh, good. Are you hungry? No, me. I'm always hungry. <laughs> I remember the first time we went to St. Moritz. Oh! What was that? Sounded to me like a shot. It came from over there, from those trees. Oh. There's someone with a gun by that tree. Get down, Steve. Get down. Ferdy, have you been hurt? No, it, it is my arm. It is all right. Oh, Paul, look. It's the, nothing. There's a man running away. Do you recognize him? No, he, he's got a scarf over his face. I can't... Oh, where are you going? Stay here, Steve. I'm going after him. Paul, don't be a fool. He's got a gun. Take a look at Ferdy's arm. I'll be back in a minute. Oh. Oh, Ferdy, are, are you badly hurt? No, no, no. The, the bullet must just have grazed my arm. Oh, dear, it's bleeding. Uh, now, take your jacket off. Uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, now, wrap this scarf round your oh, arm. No, no, no. It is nothing. It is not now very do painful. do as I tell you. Take your jacket off. Very well, but it, it, it is nothing to worry about. It. Who would do such a thing, Mrs. Temple? It is terrible. Now, keep still. Now, R wrap the scarf round. That's it. Uh, oh, oh, my husband's coming back. Did you see him, Paul? No. I didn't. The trees are pretty thick on the other side, and there's a mountain of snow. He just... He just seems to disappear. How are you, Ferdy? Oh, I, I, I am all right. Oh, you, really, Mr. Temple? Now, come on, sit by Mrs. Temple. No, no, no. I, uh... I'm going to drive. Oh, uh... I think we'd better go back to St. Moritz. Darling. Yes, of course. Oh, What's that you've got there, Paul? It's a cigarette case. I think our friend must have dropped it. Are there initials on it? Well, there's an inscription. Look. To V with love from J. V? Mm, I know what you're thinking, Steve, but I can't see Vince shooting at anyone unless it's from behind a camera. Ferdy, I'm taking you back to St. Moritz. Hello, Mr. Lonsdale. Margaret's with me. We've got a table over there. Would you care to join us? Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Careful, it's very slippy by the side of the rink. Oh, hello, Mrs. Temple. We saw you sitting on your own and we thought perhaps you'd like to join us. Thank you. You been skating? Not this afternoon. I'm afraid I've been terribly lazy. Is your husband in the village? Yes, he had one or two things to do. Mrs. Milbourne? Yes? You are wanted on the telephone, madame. Uh, shall I take it, madam? No, no, I'll take it. Is there a telephone down here? Yes, madam, there is a call box just inside the door on your left. Oh, thank you. I'll come with you, Margaret. No, no, there's no need, Morris. I'm afraid Margaret's feeling the strain. Yes. If I'd been at home, I'd have done my best to stop her from coming out here. But why? Because in spite of those telephone calls and in spite of what Margaret says... You don't believe Carl Milbourne is alive? Well, if he is, then who was the dead man? And why was he wearing Carl's clothes and carrying his papers? As the politicians say, that's a good question. They only say that when they know the answers. Do you know the answers, Mrs. Temple? No, I'm afraid I don't. But then I'm no politician. Carl was in Geneva on a perfectly straightforward business trip to see Julia Carrington. For the life of me, I fail to see why he should have become involved in all this mystery. Mrs. Temple, tell me, what does your husband make of it? I mean, what does he really think? He must have some idea by now of what's behind it all. I'm afraid, like most husbands, Paul doesn't always confide in me. I don't believe that. <laughs> I'm afraid you are a politician after all. Oh, no. Oh, hello, here's Margaret. She... She certainly looks worried. Yes, she does. 
What is it, Margaret? It was a call from London. It's my housekeeper, Mrs. Rhodes. She's had an accident. Something went wrong with one of the fuses, and, and she tried to mend it, but unfortunately the silly woman... Is she badly hurt? Well, she's had a very nasty shock, I'm afraid. I, I'm going back, Morris. I, I'm leaving first thing tomorrow morning. Do you have to? Or ten to one, there's nothing you can do when you get there? Well, there probably isn't, but I'll feel terribly guilty if I don't go back. You know best, my dear. Would you like some tea? Yes. Yes, I think I would. Mrs. Dimple? Yes, thank you. Waiter. Kellner. Is that you, Paul? No, this is Danny. Oh, hello, Danny. Hello, Steve. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm all right. You don't sound all right. Look, can I have a word with Paul? I'm sorry, he's not here. I've been expecting him all afternoon. As a matter of fact, when I heard the phone ringing, I thought that was... Oh, wait a minute. He's just arrived. Steve, I'm sorry, I'm so... Who's on the phone? Danny Clayton. He wants to talk to you. Oh. Thanks. Hello, Danny. Hello, Paul. I just wanted to say how sorry I was about this morning, about the lunch date. Oh, that's all right. Is, is Miss Carrington better now? Yeah, she's quite recovered and full of apologies, as usual. She wants to know if you and Steve could have dinner with us tonight. Well, eh... Uh... It's rather short notice, isn't it? Well, I know, but we'll try and make it if you can. Ask Steve, see what she says. All right. Julia's asked us to dinner. Would you like to go, Steve? It's up to you, darling. All right, Danny. Um, eight o'clock, how's that? That's great. We'll look forward to it. See you then. Bye. Goodbye. Paul, I wondered what on earth had happened to you. Where have you been? I've been very worried, darling. Yes, I'm sorry, dear. I should have phoned you, but I've been very busy. Hmm. Steve, you don't happen to have seen Lonsdale this afternoon? Yes. I had tea with him and Mrs. Milbourne. Did you? She's going back to London. Her housekeeper's had an accident. She's very upset about it. Oh? When is she leaving, do you know? Tomorrow morning, I think, early. Although I believe there is some difficulty about getting her a reservation. I see. Paul, what is it? Hmm? Oh, uh, nothing. I was just thinking. I'm going to have a bath, Steve. Will you run it for me? Yes, all right. You're up to something, Mr. Temple. Ah, here you are at last. I went back for my shoes. I can't wear these boots in the house. <laughs> well, jump in, then. Uh, I'll sit beside you. Um, that's, that's fine. It. Mm. Um... How long will it take us? About 15 minutes, sir. Oh, then we're late, Steve. It's nearly 8 o'clock now. I've never seen it snow as hard as it did this morning. <laughs> Uh, we're just coming to the entrance of the Villa Sobolini, sir. It's over on the right. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, I, I can see the gates. I shall open the gate, sir. Right. Oh, it's very cozy in here. I should be sorry to get out of the car. <laughs> I don't think it's as cold outside as it looks. It couldn't be. <laughs> hey. He doesn't seem to be able to get the gates open. No. He's coming back. I'm sorry, sir. I cannot get the gates open. They're blocked with snow. No. Oh. Uh, how far is the villa? Uh, you can see the lights through the trees. It will take you about two or three minutes, unless you get to wait while I clear the snow. It'll be much quicker to walk, I imagine. I'm afraid it will, sir. What about it, Steve? Yes, all right. Uh, what time shall I pick you up, sir? Oh, about, um, 10.30. I shall have the gates cleared by then and drive right up to the house, sir. Thank you. Ready, Steve? Yes, I'm ready. The snow isn't too bad to walk on. Nice and crisp. Mm. It's a lovely night. Yes. What are you thinking about, Paul? Uh, nothing, 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 Steve. I was just thinking. That's all. What happened this afternoon? Well, I met a man called Schmidt. He's a colleague of Walter Nider's. 
We went back to his office and I made one or two phone calls. As a matter of fact, I spoke to Sir Graham. Sir Graham? Mm. Amongst other things, I wanted to know how Dolly Brazer was getting along. Oh, how is she? I'm glad to say she's going to be all right, but they're keeping her in hospital for a week or so. Has she made a statement yet? No, but Sir Graham seems to think that she will. Apparently, she asked to see me again yesterday and... <coughs> Steve, did you hear that? What was it? I could have sworn I heard someone calling. Listen. There you are. Wait, it sounds as if someone's hurt. Where's it coming from, Steve? I, I think it's over there, near those bushes. You stay here, darling, on the drive. Then if I need any Oh, no, help... no, I, I'm going with you. Well, then keep close behind me. Well, Paul, what's that down there? Hmm? On the ground by that bush. Oh. It's a knife. The... There's blood on it. Sounds as if... Wait a minute. Stay where you are, Steve. Yes. Over here, Steve. And be careful, it's very slippery. Now, I found him. Look, he's almost buried underneath the snow. Who is it, Paul? I don't know. I can't see his face. Give me a hand, Steve. We've got to try and... Get him out of this snow. Yes. Uh, now, look, if, if, if you push the snow over the other side, I, right. I'll try and lift his shoulders. That's it. Now, don't strain yourself. That's better. Steve. Oh. Look who it is. It's Vince Langham. Vince, are you badly hurt? Can you hear me? Paul, do you think we ought to move him? Don't, don't you think it'd be better if I went up to the house? Yes. I'll go. Yes. Is that you, Paul? Yes, now, don't worry. We'll soon get you out of here. Steve's going up to the house for no, help. No, wait. I, I want to tell you something. What is it? Uh, what do you want to tell me? I, I want to tell you about... Carl. Oh, go on, Vince. This business first started with Carl Milbourne and... Yes? And... too young to die. In the fifth episode of Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery, Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. Production for the BBC was by Martin C. Webster. Tomorrow, a stabbing, a fatal fire, blackmail and hush money. Just your average Wednesday for Paul Temple. A haunted house in the English countryside. It was too good to be true. On BBC Radio 4 Extra, stories from life's murkier places. There have been enough kidnappings lately for me not to have to spell it out. I want to go home. I want to get out of here. Stories by Ruth Rendell, read by Miles Jupp, Hattie Morahan and Samuel West. To kill her, all he had to do was not pay. Wasn't this, in fact, the answer to the dilemma by which he had been beset for nearly a year? Short Works, a season of murder, mystery and suspense. We're safe enough here, he said to himself. On BBC Radio 4 Extra, continues this afternoon at 2.45. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Now, from 2008, part two of Garibaldi's Grand Scheme. Today, Misha Glenny explores the background to Garibaldi's most glorious exploit, the landing of a thousand men on Sicily, and the heroic efforts that liberated all of southern Italy. I'm standing under the Garibaldi Gate in Marsala on the western tip of Sicily. This triumphal arch celebrates the beginning of Garibaldi's greatest adventure when he landed here on the 11th of May 1860 with his faithful band of fighters known as the Mille, the mythical thousand men who followed his call to liberate southern Italy from its Bourbon overlords. Now, as invading armies go, this was a ragbag. Unravel the mystery. Episode 6. See you in London.
this business first started with Carl Milborn and... Yes, Vince? And too young to die. You mean the novel by Richard Randolph? Yes. Paul, I wrote that book. What? I'm Richard Randolph. Paul, I don't think he realizes what he's saying. Yes, yes, I do. I wrote that book and sent it to Carl Milborn. He liked the book and I told him how I got the idea for the story. Yes. It was while I was in Hollywood. I was doing a picture for... Steve, go up to the house and ask them to phone for a doctor. Yes, all right, Paul. I... I must tell you about the book. It was based on something that... that happened to... To Julia Carrington? Yes. And you told Carl Milbourne about it? Yes. I see. Vince, what happened tonight? Did you really have an appointment with Julia? Yes. Danny Clayton telephoned and said she wanted to see me. Yes. I was on my way up to the house when... when someone came up behind me and... and you must keep warm, Vince. Here, let me put this coat around you. Okay, Doctor? Yes, I think so. But he can't be moved, Mr. Clayton. You'll have to stay the night here. Is that all right, Danny? Yes, of course. I've already spoken to Miss Carrington about it. But, but she wants to know what he was doing in the grounds at this time of night. But you telephoned me and said Miss Carrington wanted to see me. I didn't telephone you. But you did. You, you told me to come you here. You must be quiet, Mr. Langham. It's essential. I'm sorry, but there must be no more talking, gentlemen. Yes, of course. I'm sorry, Doctor. Try to get some sleep, Vince. We'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Good night, Paul. Good night. And thanks for everything. Obviously, the man's lying, Mr. Temple. I'm sorry, but I don't agree, Miss Carrington. Do you mean you don't believe Danny when he says that he didn't telephone Mr. Lang? Someone telephoned him. If it wasn't Danny, then someone impersonated him. But why should anyone impersonate me? Anyway, it's extremely annoying. Annoying? If the newspapers get hold of the story, they'll assume that I invited Langham here because he's a film director. Would it be such a bad idea if the newspapers did print the story? The whole story? What do you mean? I think it's about time we put our cards on the table. Someone tried to murder Vince tonight and they very nearly succeeded. Now, it's my Are you suggesting that Julia had something to do with this affair? I'm suggesting it's about time Miss Carrington told me the truth about herself and the truth about Carl Milbourne. What do you know about Milbourne? He was blackmailing you, wasn't he? Well, Miss Carrington? Yes, he was. He still is. Well, don't you think you'd better tell me about it? It started in Hollywood, didn't it? Yes. Many years ago when you were drinking heavily? Yes. Oh, go on. I had a hideout in an apartment house in Santa Barbara. I used to go there by myself at weekends. I was on top in those days, yet I wasn't happy. I don't expect you to understand why I wasn't happy, but... Well, one night during a drinking bout, I accidentally set fire to the apartment. I escaped, but many people lost their lives that night, including Danny's mother and father. Go on, Miss Gangland. There was an inquiry, and I went to the head of the studio and told him the whole story. Naturally, I wanted to accept full responsibility for what had happened. But the studio wouldn't hear of it. We were halfway through a picture. <laughs> and the only person who knew that I was in Santa Barbara at the night of the fire was the manager of the apartment house. The studio paid him $40,000 to keep his mouth shut. Not only that, but they provided me with an alibi as well. It must have been a ghastly experience. Yes, it was, Mrs. Temple. Well, when Danny left college, I made up my mind to take care of him. Later, I retired and came to live in Europe. Then one day, Carl Milborn came to see me. He showed me a manuscript of a novel called Too Young to Die. As soon as I read it, I knew that it was my life story. Yes. Randolph heard your story from the manager of the apartment house and based his novel on it. Milborn told me he was Randolph and, and that... He told you he was Randolph? Yes, he was the author and owned all the rights in the book. Well, naturally, I asked him not to publish it. 
He agreed, subject to certain considerations. How much have you paid Carl Milbourne? Up to the time of the accident, about £40,000. £40,000? Yes. Were you relieved when you heard about the accident? I'm afraid I was. Mm. I thought that would be the end of the matter, but it wasn't. A short time after the accident, I had a phone call from Mrs Milbourne. She said she felt convinced that her husband was still alive, and she asked me if I'd heard from him. And what did you say? I lied. I said I'd never even met her husband. Mm. Go on, Miss Carrington. About a week ago, I had a phone call from Carl Milbourne himself. He told me I had to make one more payment of $60,000. Did he tell you where to deliver the money? No, he simply told me to come to Sir Moritz and wait. He said he'd contact me here. And has he? No, not yet. I begged Julia to go to the police, but she wouldn't hear of it. Finally, I persuaded her to see you. Then at the very last moment, on the day you arrived... She funked it? Yes. Well, I haven't funked it now, Mr. Temple. I've told you the whole truth. What do you think I should do now? There's no doubt in my mind what you should do, Miss Carrington. No doubt at all. Oh, good evening, Mr. Temple. Good evening. I understand Mr. Lonsdale is a friend of yours. Well, uh, yes, we know Mr. Lonsdale. Uh, there's been a rather unfortunate incident, Mr. Temple. Oh? Uh, one of the maids went into Mr. Lonsdale's room thinking it was empty. She heard groans coming from the bathroom and... Mr. Lonsdale had taken some tablets. He was very sick. The maid sent for me and I got the doctor, of course. Go on. I noticed a letter on the bedside table addressed to Mrs. Milburn and I put it in my pocket. But as soon as Mr. Lonsdale recovered, he asked for it and he tore it up immediately, Mr. Temple. The doctor thinks that Mr. Lonsdale attempted suicide. Have you told Mrs. Milburn about this? Uh, no, it happened after she left, sir. Left? I thought she was leaving tomorrow morning. Uh, no, she left for Zurich this evening, sir. I see. Uh, how, how is Mr. Lonsdale now? Oh, he seems very much better. I thought you ought to know about this, Mr. Temple. Yes, of course, it's very kind of you. I'll go upstairs and have a word with him. Room... Uh, 32, sir. He's in the annex. I'm sorry that fool of a manager sent you up here, Temple. Yes, he was quite perturbed. Well, I expect he was. He thought I'd been trying to kill myself, the idiot. What happened exactly? Well, I get these violent migraines. I had one all day, so I took some tablets I keep for it, and I must have taken too many. <laughs> it's happened before. I dare say it'll happen again. I see. Well, I'm glad it was a false alarm and that you're feeling better. I assure you, Temple, I'm perfectly all right now. No nothing to worry about. Good. Um, may I use your phone? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Temple here, put me through to my room, please. Hello, Steve. Um, it's all right, darling. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, he had a migraine and took too many tablets, that's all. No, 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 no. That was a lot of nonsense. Hmm. I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes. All right, Steve. When I see that fool of a manager, I'll give him a piece of my mind. I shall have a good night's sleep and forget all about it. Oh, um... I understand your sister left this evening. Yes, she managed to get a reservation on the night flight from Zurich. Oh. Well, good night, Lonsdale. If you should want anything in the night, just give me a ring. Thank you, Temple. That's very kind of you. Good night, then. Good night. Steve? I'm in the bathroom. I'll be with you in a second. Uh, where's your mirror, darling? Mirror? Ah. It's on the dressing table. Ah, yes. Paul, what was the point of that phone call from Lonsdale's uh, room? The... Oh, what are you doing with the mirror? There was a blotting pad on Lonsdale's desk that had been used recently, so I asked him if I could use the phone. Mm -hmm. I pocketed a piece of the blotter while I was talking to oh, him. Oh, let me look. Well, it's rather smudgy. I can't read all of it. Uh, dear mm -hmm. Margaret, mm -hmm. deeply... Um, shocked, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Shocked. Deeply shocked by what you have told me cannot... Become in, involved. That's involved in this affair. But what's he mean? What affair? Well, it could be the Milbourne affair, I suppose. Yes, but why should he write his sister a note like that? Surely he doesn't think that she's responsible for. Oh, Paul. You don't think Margaret Milbourne's the person behind all this? And now she's trying to involve her brother? Yes. Hence the note and suicide attempt. Yes. It would be rather funny if we'd been underrating Mrs. Milbourne all this time, wouldn't it? It would be even funnier if we'd been underrating Mr. Lonsdale.
Did you get your paper? Yes, yeah. We are going to breakfast if you're ready. Oh, my tummy's been ready for the last half hour. <laughs> oh, here's Lonsdale just coming out. Good morning. Morning. How are you feeling this morning, Mr. Lonsdale? Oh, I feel fine, thank you. I'm sorry about that spot of bother last night, Mrs. Temple. It must have given you quite a shock. Yes. Well, you look all right now, Lonsdale. Thank you. I'm just off to the hospital to see Miss Sam. Is she getting better? Yes, but it's a slow job, I'm afraid. Oh, by the way, Temple, I meant to ask you last night, have you heard any more from the police about Carl? Uh, no, nothing, I'm afraid. If there should be any development, I'll let you know, of course. Yes, do. Well, I, I won't keep you from your breakfast. Fine, probably see you at lunch. Yes, of course. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Goodbye. Mr. Temple? Uh, yes? You're wanted on the telephone, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Here's the paper, Steve. Oh, thank uh, you. I'll see you at the table. Yes, all right. This way, sir. Hello? Oh, Paul? Yes, yeah, speaking. This is Danny. Oh, good morning, Danny. What can I do for you? Julia had a phone call about half an hour ago. You can probably guess who it was. Yes. Julia answered the phone herself. She said it was the same man as before, the same voice. He said he was Carl Milborn and that he wanted a final payment of $200,000. 200000 What did Julia say? Well, she did what you told her to do. She agreed to everything. Good. Go on, Danny. Well, the instructions he gave me are simple. I've got to take the money to London, and on Friday night, at precisely 8 o'clock, ring uh, Putney 1347. Putney 1347? That's right. Presumably, our friend will be waiting for the call, and then he'll tell me where to meet him. I see. Friday. That gives us four clear days. All right, Danny, go ahead. Carry out my instructions. You sure you know what you're doing, Paul? Yes, I know what I'm doing. Okay, you're boss. Oh, um, how's Vince this morning? Oh, he's much better. He's going back to his hotel this afternoon. Good. Well, see you in London. Yes, see you in London, then. Excuse me, sir. Oh, yes, what is it, Charlie? Inspector Lloyd's arrived, sir. Oh, good, show him in. Yes, wife, you please, sir? Hello, Temple. Nice to see you again. Oh, thank you, Inspector. Charlie, bring us some coffee. Uh, not for me, thank you. I'm in rather a hurry. Oh, all right, Charlie. We've traced that number for you. It's a call box on Putney Heath. A call box? Yes. I've arranged to have the box kept under observation from midday on Friday. When Mr. Clayton makes his call, it'll be recorded. Thank you, Inspector. Uh, incidentally, we've seen Mr. Clayton. He's staying at the Savoy and seems quite anxious to cooperate. Good. Well, I'll be off. I just wanted you to know that everything was under control. We'll be in touch with you later. Do you mind if we have the radio off, Steve? Oh, you're very edgy this morning. I just can't understand why I haven't heard from Danny Clayton. Have you tried to get hold of him? Yes, I phoned the hotel twice, but each time he's out. Oh, why don't you try Sir Graham or the inspector? They may have heard something. I've been a damn fool, Steve. I shouldn't have left everything to the police. I should have gone out to Putney Heath myself last night and waited... Oh, what is it, Charlie? Inspector Lloyd's here, sir. Oh, good. Ah, oh, come on in, Inspector. Good morning, Mrs. Temple. Good morning, Inspector. Uh, don't go, Charlie. Is that the tape recorder? Yes. Everything went according to plan, I'm glad to say. Uh, take the recorder and plug it in, Charlie. Yes, sir. Now, be careful. The tape's on the machine. Well, what happened? Uh, Mr. Clayton made the call, and there was a man waiting for it outside the box. He had a scarf over his face, and we didn't recognize him. Well, not at first, that is. When he left the box, we tailed him out to Notting Hill Gate. He has a flat out there. His name's Spinner. We've heard of that gentleman before. Did you pick him up? Well, we're not that stupid. Hmm. It's not Mr. Spinner we're after. It's all ready now, sir. Thank you, Charlie. You can go. I particularly want you to listen to this phone call, Mrs. Temple. Listen carefully. Well, why me, Inspector? You'll soon see. Is that Putney 1347? Mr. Clayton? Yes. You got the money? Yeah, I've got the money. What do you want me to do? Now listen. Now listen carefully. Put the money in a case and take it to the Carlos Club in Melton Square. What, now tonight? No, tomorrow night. Any time after 11. Leave the case with the cloakroom attendant. Give the man a pound and tell him someone called Leslie will pick it up later. Someone called Leslie? That's right. Carlos Club, Melton Square, tomorrow night. Have you got that? Yeah, I've got it. You're sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, that's all, Mr. Clayton. Good night. But 
I know that voice. I know that man's voice. I was hoping you'd say that, Mrs. Temple. It's the man who bought the car here. Do you remember, Paul? He said he said his name was Stone, and you told him to bring uh, the car. Yes. That's right, Mrs. Temple. Well, uh, Stone, or Spinner, as he now calls himself, is obviously working for someone called Leslie. That's just a cover-up name for... Uh, Inspector, uh, tell me about the Carlos Club, do you know mm -hmm. it? Yes, it's been open about six months. A perfectly respectable club, as far as these places go. Who owns it? Well, I think it's a syndicate of some kind. I take it you're watching the place, Inspector? Well, naturally. It's under close observation. There'll be a cordon round the club from eight o'clock onwards. Good. Perhaps you'd care to join us this evening. Oh, just to try and stop us, Inspector. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Carlos Club. Uh, good evening. Are you a member? No, I'm afraid not. I'm just delivering this case for someone. Uh, where is the cloakroom? It's over there, sir. Oh, thank you. Well, well. Hello, Clayton. Langham. Well, well, I didn't expect to see you here. Oh, how are you? Oh, I'm much better, thanks. Now, what are you doing here? You didn't tell me you were coming to London. Uh, no, I, I just dropped into deliver something for someone and well what are you doing here <laughs> chubby costello plays here uh, chubby costello well don't tell me you've never heard of chubby costello he's written the music for my new picture oh i see oh uh, well um if you'll excuse me oh, look, I... won't you let me buy you a drink uh, no thanks are you sure yeah quite sure thank you uh is julia with you uh, no she's not oh uh, where are you staying I i'm at the savoy uh, call me call me sometime yes i'll do that good night Good night, Clayton. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. I want to leave this case with you. Uh, someone called Leslie will pick it up later this evening. A gentleman, I presume, sir. Uh, oh, yes, I imagine so. And um, here we are. This is for you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the case will be quite safe. I'll see your friend gets it. Thank you. Good night. Uh, good night, sir. I must say, everything seems perfectly normal. I can't even see a police car. No, you're not supposed to. As a matter of fact, Lloyd's tackled the problem very well, even down to keeping this parking space for us. Yes. Oh, Paul, there's someone in that van oh, over on the other side of the road. Oh, don't worry about the van, Steve, or the blue saloon, hmm? or that black Ford over there. Hmm? It's Lloyd and his merry men. Oh, I see. He said he was going to surround the place, and by Timothy, he has. <laughs> I don't understand why we haven't seen Danny. We saw him go into the club and yet he... He's... probably left by another exit. And Vince? Well, it's my bet Vince is still in there. Paul, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. Mm -hmm. When Julia Carrington first met Carl Milbourne, why did you... Paul, look who's coming out. I'm watching. Is that the same case he's carrying? Yes, that's it. And that's the person we're waiting for. Wind the window down, Steve. What are you going to do? I want to get to the corner before our friend with the case does. Good evening, Lonsdale. Temple, let me give you a lift. I, I thought you were still in Switzerland. No, we got back three days ago. But I telephoned your hotel this morning to make sure you were still... I, I spoke to the manager and he told me you got to Lucerne for the weekend. Yes, I know. Actually, you didn't speak to the manager. You spoke to a man called Schmidt. Schmidt? I told him you'd probably check up on me. Why, you interfere? Give me the case, Lonsdale. Just try and get it. Lonsdale, don't be a fool. You'll never get away with it. Lonsdale, look out! The car! How is he, Sergeant? I don't know, sir. The inspector's with him at the moment. Well, he ran straight into us, just as we were accelerating. I tried to stop him. Oh, I know you did, sir. Anyway, the ambulance will be here any minute now. Oh, uh, here's the inspector. Oh, good evening, inspector. Is he badly hurt? I'm afraid he's dead. But what happens about the money in the suitcase, Paul? Will Julia get it back? Yes, of course. You've no need to worry about that, Danny. <laughs> Mr. Temple, how did this business first start? Well, it started when Vince Langham heard about the fire in Santa Barbara and decided to write a book about the affair. When the book was finished, Vince sent it to Frida Sands to be typed. 
The woman who typed it was Dolly Brazer. Dolly Brazer? Mm, she had a temporary job with the Sands Agency at the time. Oh, so that's how she became involved. Yes. Vince showed the book to Carl Milborn, who bought it outright and persuaded Vince to use a pseudonym, Richard Randolph. But how did my brother get involved? Maurice Lansdale had lent your husband a large sum of money and he wanted immediate repayment. They were discussing this when Carl mentioned the book Too Young to Die. Lonsdale, who was already operating several rackets, realised that Julia was an extremely wealthy woman and that the book could be used as a means of blackmail. Well, go on, Paul. Acting on Lonsdale's instructions, Carl Milbourne went to Geneva and did a deal with Julia. But on the way home, he was knocked down and killed. Oh, so he was killed? Yes. But Lonsdale was determined that the plan should go ahead, so he telephoned Julia, saying that he was Carl, and that the accident had been faked. Later, he put a doubt in your mind about the accident, Mrs. Milbourne. Oh, yes, that's when he sent me the hat with a note in it. Yes. But the note was in Carl's handwriting. It was an undated note which Carl had previously sent to your brother. Lonsdale just dated it. Oh, I see. But why should Lonsdale want to convince Mrs. Milbourne that her husband was alive? He knew that if Mrs. Milbourne thought her husband wasn't dead, she'd say so in no uncertain terms and that Julia would hear about it. But what Lonsdale didn't bargain for was the fact that Margaret would consult me. When he discovered I was a friend of Dolly's, he told her to warn me to keep out of the case. But why was the poor girl attacked, Paul? Oh, to show me that he meant business and to show Dolly that she must never talk. Mm. Oh, he scared hell out of me on the train that night. Although I must admit I didn't recognize him at the time. It was dark and he had a scarf over his face. He frightened you too, didn't he, Mrs. Milbourne? He frightened you into telling us that story about Danny and Maidenhead? Yes. But I did try to stop you from going onto the houseboat, Mr. Temple. It was a friend of mine, an actor, who telephoned you at the hotel. He's quite well known. Oh, you know, I thought I'd heard that voice before somewhere. Tell me, Mrs. Milbourne, when did you first realise that your brother had been lying to you? Oh, when I got to St. Moritz. Up till then, I, I really did believe that Carl was alive. I thought the two phone calls I'd received in London and Geneva were genuine. Was Carl's voice like your brother's? Yes. Very much so, especially on the telephone. But when did you actually find out about your brother? The night we arrived in St. Moritz, Morris came into my room. He was angry and he'd been drinking. He said that Carl had been blackmailing Julia Carrington and that the blackmailing had to continue. He said if I didn't help him, he'd throw suspicion onto me. Which he did, the moment you left St. Moritz. Is this true? Yes. He pretended to commit suicide and left a note behind, blaming you for everything. Oh, Morris. Uh, Paul, tell me, how does Vince Langham fit into all this? Well, although Vince didn't know what was going on, he wasn't above trying a spot of blackmail himself. He wanted Julia to make a film for him, any film. My bet is, if Julia had said yes, he'd have sued the publishers and done his damnedest to get the book back. Yes, I think you're right, Mr. Temple. I know my brother was worried about Langham. He thought he was up to something. Because of this, he, he started to throw suspicion onto him. The cigarette case? Yes. Later, he decided to get rid of him. I don't have to tell you and Mrs. Temple what happened. No. Well, I think Vince has learned his lesson. Well, Paul, what's going to happen to the book now? It doesn't matter what happens to it now, Steve. It doesn't matter? No. I phoned Julia this morning. I told her about Lonsdale and what happened last night. And she's decided to tell the truth about herself. About Hollywood, about the fire, about everything. You mean at long last she really is going to write an autobiography? Oh, no. <laughs> Julia can hardly write a letter, let alone a book. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Just over an hour ago, I had a call from New York, from World Magazine. They want you to write the story of Julia Carrington, Paul. Me? They want Paul to write it? Yeah, but that's impossible. I'm up to my eyes in work. I've got a new book planned for the autumn, and later in the year I've Wait got... a minute. Does this mean that we'd have to go back to St. Moritz? I'm afraid so. Steve, what are you getting at? Y you mean now, Danny, straight away? Straight away, Steve. Steve, what are you getting at? He'll write it, Danny. By Timothy, he'll write <laughs> it. In the final episode of Paul Temple and the Geneva Mystery, the part of Margaret Milbourne... Carl is alive, Mr. Temple. I've spoken to him. ...was played by Isabel Dean. Danny Clayton... I work for Julia Carrington. I'm her confidential secretary, amongst other things. 
by Nigel Graham. Vince Langham. I wrote that book. I'm Richard Randolph. By Simon Lack. Julia Carrington. As soon as I read it, I knew that it was my life story. By Polly Murch. Inspector Lloyd. Well, of course we didn't pick him up. We're not that stupid. By Wilfred Carter. Charlie. She was in a bit of a tisser, so I put her in the study. By John Baddeley. Maurice Lonsdale. He thought I'd been trying to kill myself, the idiot. By Patrick Barr. Steve. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? I've always wanted to ride in a kucha. By Marjorie Westbury. And Paul Temple. Don't you think you'd better tell the whole story, Miss Carrington? Was played by Peter Cook. The Paul Temple serials are written by Francis Durbridge and produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Do you know, I had a feeling he'd sort all that out. Looking ahead, the kindly detective Inspector Purbright will be probing dark deeds in the world of small-time animal charities in Charity Ends at Home, one of Colin Watson's Flaxborough Chronicles. That's at this time tomorrow. Now on screen, she's all jazz hands and sugary sweetness. While off screen, she's lonely and miserable. That's the life of the TV chef played by Imelda Staunton in Radio 4 Extra's drama Perfect Meringues next weekend. Newly divorced Lizzie is driven to acting impulsively, which leads in turn to some tetchy conversations with herself. So, Lizzie, it's finally come to it. Ellie's flying off to the sunshine, bonding with Daddy and the teen bride, and you'll be home alone for Christmas. Mm, I could stay home. Wouldn't bother me. Keep the curtains shut. Not answer the phone. Fake going to Wiltshire to stay with mystery friends. What friends? You don't know anybody in Wiltshire. You can come to us. We're having your mother, so we might as well have you. Starring Imelda Staunton, Christopher Biggins and Leslie Joseph... Perfect Meringues by Laurie Graham is next Sunday at four o'clock here on BBC Radio 4 Extra. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Sent you, 
Og jeg starter vores to svinge det for der har vi Hvad vi sådan ikke om er, hvis I vil med at få en rødt nat, der var det snart færdig, der var så i rejsel med et åben. Og det gik færdig til. Det er ikke mere at slå, og har du også blivet bygget og snødt. Hold mig på åben. Det er ikke så vi er ikke om er. Hvad er det, når vi er rødt nat? Det er ikke så vi er rødt nat. Vi er ikke så vi er rødt nat. Vi er ikke så vi er rødt nat. Let's not see them. Here they have no job. Here that's a new surprise. A sister with a mini Jewish. Here lost. That's not the full well. The Jewish that one they are making the new sofa. They all lost caps in it. Show me love them. What's the alarm that we the wind yard is there as an whistle? That's near a guy in wind. Can't no more stop. Hard now, Mister. Yeah. Good as for ya. Men jeg elsker det. Men jeg elsker det. 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 Det er en rød hed, og hvis det er... Det er en rød hed. 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 Det er en Nej, men just nu går jeg på et godt mål, eller der er der i landet, der er i lyst. Så nu går jeg på råd, der er ikke sige, der er ikke sige, der er ikke sige, der er ikke sige. Jeg vil bare have for dig, for du vil ha dig. Og jeg ser dig på tusind, hvis det er der sidste tisne. Det er en sejl, når jeg har med lidt, sådan alt, der er bare råd, der. Men om så vil du ikke nå for dig. Hvordan? Hvad er det, så? Fint, så er det ikke sådan, for jeg har været med, så er det. Hvad er det, så er det? 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 Hvad er det, så Det er det, der er ikke så lige her. Det er det. 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 ฉันรู้มั้ยเมื่อเธอไม่รู้ว่าอย่างนี้เมื่อเธอเห็นเพื่อนเพื่อนเธอเสียชีวิตเมื่อเธอเนี่ยเสียชีวิตเมื่อเ